Pablo. Like a school, no? Okay, thank you. Um, hoping that the lunch break was pleasant. Uh, we can start with the uh, afternoon session. Uh, we have two presentations um, uh, online. Um, in particular, the first one is, the title is Review of the Geographic and Bathymetric Distribution of Mild Beds in Tunisian Waters. It will be um, done by Rauya Ganem. Uh, please, uh, Mrs. Ganem, you have the floor. Ravi, est-ce que tu peux partager ton écran Est-ce que c'est bon vous, vous le voyez Do you see my, uh, my screen Yeah, ok. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, uh, now we are going to move to another uh, emblematic habitat uh, that needs more attention from a scientific community, which is uh, Merbet. So, I will start by saying that uh, Merbet uh, are biodiversity hotspots uh, and they have been described uh, as ecological in years uh, as they enhance biological and functional diversities. So these habitats must be thought of uh, as a non-renewable resource due to their extremely low growth rate. Uh, Roderick's beds and integrities is treated, treated by human activities and also by phenomena like uh, ocean warming and ocean acidification. And the present knowledge. I'm so, uh, sorry, madam. It's just to so, um, stress that we, we, we see only the, the first slide, but uh, there is no chance to follow your presentation. Perfect. And then we, now, now we, we see the, the title. Thank you. Yes, it's the introduction. <laughs> it's not uh, written in the slides. So, uh, Roderick's Beds Integrity, uh, I said, is driven by human activities and also by uh, ocean warming and uh, acidification. And the present knowledge of this habitat uh, concerning the real distribution in the Mediterranean and particularly in Southern Mediterranean Sea uh, currently constrains the implementation of a comprehensive com conservation um, uh, management plan for this uh, habitat. So, the distribution of mer beds in the Mediterranean Sea is patchy, and uh, uh, they are reported from most of the Mediterranean coast, uh, coastal sectors, and also a significant absence of reports is evident along the coasts of uh, Eastern Adriatic, Libya, Egypt, Syria, Lebanon, and the Black Sea, with an exception for the Sea uh, of uh, Marmara. The largest rhodolith uh, beds uh, identified in the Mediterranean, uh, namely those exceeding a surface of uh, 100 kilometers square, are located in the Balearic Sea, followed by Kors and the Maltese Islands. Mediterranean mer beds may occur from 0 0.5 to 150 meters, with uh, a mean depth of uh, 55 meters. And the deepest mer beds uh, was recently discovered in Balearic uh, Sea, uh, at depth between 140 and 150 meters. In Tunisia, uh, information about merbeds are very scarce and they was compiled during investigations of uh, dredged bottoms or extracted from benthic bionomic studies or from some biodiversity inventories or in some recent project mapping initiatives. So uh, the main goal of this work is to provide an updated overview of the distribution of mer beds found in Tunisian marine waters. And to attain, to attain this goal, the study was conducted along Tunisian coasts, uh, including the main islands, and to present information on the distribution of these habitats, three sectors were considered. Uh, a literature survey was uh, carried out using several bibliographic databases 
for the period from 1950 to the present, and information was also obtained from technical reports. Uh, species occurrences were also obtained from local ecological knowledge approach via interviews with, with the professional and recreational divers, and a total of nine interviews were conducted. Uh, sites, uh, also five localities were investigated using scuba diving, and the sites uh, was, uh, were selected after analyzing literature and analyzing the results of the lake survey. Diving was performed at a depth not exceeding 40 meter depth. So as a result, uh, I've said that mere beds are almost present it's at depth between one and 60 meter depth in Tunisia, and 10 mere forming algal species were identified which is which comparing to the Mediterranean Sea is a very low, um, very low number. Eight localities and 14 sites were investigated in sector one, and we found six um, uh, algal uh, forming species of mare beds in this sector. Uh, for Tabarka, uh, for example, with um, diving survey showed that they have two uh, species of uh, algal forming mervets that are present at depth between 15 and 25 meters. At Galit Island, and uh, according there are four uh, species identified, and um, these species were found at depth between 35 and 62 meter depth. At uh, Bizert locality, uh, literature survey showed that uh, the species Lithophyllum dendatum was observed at one meter depth, and the scuba diving survey uh, showed that uh, Lithotamnion coralides, coralidoides was observed at depth between one and three meters. For the uh, locality of and according to literature survey and scuba diving survey, Three species were identified uh, and uh, were located at depth between 15 and 35 meters. For the locality of Hawareya, uh, scuba diving survey showed that uh, two species were, uh, were uh, uh, recorded at 3 and uh, 18 meter depth. Concerning the sector 2, uh, three localities and four sites were investigated and uh, uh, the results show that uh, species were present from 0.5 meter at Curiat Island to 45 meter at Bank Halu. Sector, in sector three, two localities were investigated, uh, Kerkena Island, and uh, literature surveys show that uh, there are four species present in these localities at depths between 21 and 45 meters. Uh, finally, the Biben Lagoon uh, uh, shelter a very uh, spectacular reef of the uh, Yugo Brassica Florida, which is uh, unique with uh, no other similar formation in the entire Mediterranean, uh, um, with the, uh, 12 kilometers. So, I uh, uh, conclusion, I will say that neural beds are threatened by numerous anthropogenic activities like dredging, fishing, mariculture, and eutrophication. And the main threat uh, in Tunisia is from bottom trolling. Conservation value of this ecologically fragile system in Tunisia is under national legislation uh, concerning fishing, environmental impact assessment, pollution, and yes. And in addition to this legal text, many conventions have been ratified by Tunisia. Also, the action plan of the conservation of Mediterranean coralligenous and other bioconcretion has been adopted. And finally, I have to say that the review of uh, the distribution and richness of this biodiversity hotspot in Tunisia would be considered a basic step that will constitute to the implementation management uh, and conservation strategies for these emblematic habitats. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, we have time for 
some some questions. There are some. Please, uh, from the floor. Leonardo, can I? Can I ask? Uh, I am curious to know. No, no, I'm sorry. Uh, we um, wait for for a new microphone because uh, the, um, the there is no translation. In particular, the, the colleagues uh, from from Tunisia is in uh, online, and then there is a need of a microphone. Is arriving. Okay, I have a simple question. Uh, are, can you confirm that these deepest rhodolites, 120 meters you have mentioned, they are alive? And if so, what kind of species dominate on the surface? Uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the depth uh, was from literature. It was not in Tunisia. Okay, okay, okay. I understood that you have also studied. So you, you, you have no idea what kind of species are? No. In, no. Okay, thank you. Thank you. There is another question from Antonietta Rosso from online. Hi. And then Antonietta, you have the floor, please. Sorry, Antonietta, we are not uh, able to hear in you. I am curious to know the Okay. I can write. Can you, can you see me and hear me? Now, yes. Now, yes. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I am curious to know about the depth of uh, the rhodolith beds inside the lagoon and uh, in general, if there are some species, animal species, and crafting organisms that are uh, that coexist with these rhodolites, because from your uh, images uh, they seem nearly uh, clean without any species on top, growing on top. But I am curious to ask you. Thank you very much for the answer. Thank you, Antonietta. So you are asking about uh, the uh, reef in the Biben Lagoon? Yes. It's at very shallow water. I mean, it's 0 0.5 meter. And uh, any animals are uh, grow with the rhodolites there and in other sites? Stability there are many stability. Not uh, um, skeletonized, uh, carbonate skeletonized organisms. Uh, I'm not Animals sure. having a skeleton. Wait. Hmm? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other question from the floor? Seems no. And then, thank you. Mrs. Ghanem, we can move to the next uh, presentation, the last one for this afternoon, always online. Inside of the biodiversity of coralligenous and dark habitats from northern Tunisia, we have a focus on Bryozoan. Um, please, uh, um, Rakia Airi Kliti, you have the floor. Il faut partager l'écran. Oui, je suis en train de euh, partager. 
Bah, il faut et autoriser et... tous les cookies mm -hmm. et lancer la réunion. Ouvrir. Yes. Et maintenant, il faut pas partager l'écran. Il faut cliquer sur ouvrir. Il faut, eh, oui, eh, vous pouvez partager en effet deux eh, écrans. Vous devez, devez choisir l'écran avec votre présentation et pas celle de la, de la réunion. Moi, dit du point de vue technique, vous devez choisir l'écran euh, de la présentation. Merci. Il ne faut pas cliquer sur lancer la réunion. Non, 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 non. Il faut cliquer, il faut taper sur partager l'écran. Sur les, les, les commandes de Zoom. Alors, sur Zoom, vous devez cliquer sur partager l'écran, sur les contrôles de Zoom. Il y a une icône verte. Cliquez sur l'icône verte, OK. Choisissez OK, la présentation. Et ouvrez la présentation à tout écran. Cliquez sur la présentation. Yes, it's done. Non, alors, ah. cliquez une autre fois sur partager l'écran et choisissez ce, seulement la présentation, pas l'écran tout entier. OK. Euh, modalité présentation. Cliquez sur Je crois que vous avez sur, sur, euh, ah, sur ouvert dans écrans. Word. Vous devez choisir pour ouvrir ce fichier euh, PowerPoint. Non, il s'agit d'une PowerPoint. Ok. Yeah. It's already a PowerPoint. Yeah. On la voit, la, la voit sur la PowerPoint, on ne la voit pas sur, à tout écran. Pour le screen. I see it here. I don't know about. Um, si vous voulez, on peut choisir cette solution. On va um, partager les, les slides directement ici de, de Gênes et vous parler sur les slides qui uh, seront partagés par uh, la secrétariat. Peut-être que c'est la solution la meilleure. Vous êtes d'accord, uh, Madame Gahanem? Uh, yes, if you will be. Oui, oui, oui. Ok. Rakia, on, on va conclure la session et on va essayer de euh, résoudre le problème pour la prochaine session. Merci. D'accord.
Ok. J'arrête le partage. Alors, on, on peut passer euh, à ce point. On va passer à la discussion euh, pour euh, euh, voir, de, de faire des considérations par rapport à les sujets qu'on a euh, passés ce matin et avec euh, cette, cette prim, première partie de l'après-midi. Il y a des interventions sur... Euh, en particulier, on peut dire qu'on a euh, touché des, plusieurs différents arguments. Juste pour, pour le rappeler, euh, on a parlé de, de la de, 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 de database CoreMedNet. Et ensuite, pour avoir la vision générale des, des informations dont on dispose sur, sur, ce, sur le sujet coréalégène, de façon ensuite de pouvoir faire des évaluations à niveau méditerranéen et l'importance de collaborer et partager nos informations pour rendre encore plus puissant le système. Euh, euh, Antonio Tarosso a nous présenté euh, l'approche qu'ils ont en train d'utiliser sur le point de vue technique, technologique, soit euh, avancement scientifique pour les études sur le collagène dans un site euh, dans la partie sud euh, est de la Sicile, euh, l'importante présentation par rapport à, à les atolls de coralligènes, l'atoll euh, des coralligènes profondes dans la zone entre Cap Corse et aussi l'Italie, et euh, les aspects liés à l'importance des euh, banques à vermétide euh, dans la, partie sur les côtes orientales de la Méditerranée et euh, ensuite la dernière présentation euh, de, ce, de cet après-midi, première partie de l'après-midi, euh, par rapport à la distribution, euh, soit une vision générale de la distribution des, des, des marl bed pour la Méditerranée avec une particulière information spécifique pour le maire de, Tuni de la Tunisie. Euh, juste euh, après ça, je réalisais que j'étais en train de parler en français et pas en anglais, mais je m'excuse de ça. C'est juste le problème des après-midi, de l'après-midi, oui. Et c'est à vous de, de faire quelques considérations en plus. Ah, euh, je vous que Antonietta Rosso, il a demandé la, la parole. Antonietta, s'il te plaît, tu peux poser tes considérations. Merci. Uh, thank you very much. I prefer to speak in English. Uh, and um, uh, my question is uh, for um, uh, Cristina Linares uh, about the um, database and the distribution map of the coralligenous she uh, showed us and the problem of uh, uh, areas that are not covered by dots, that means uh, from where coralligenous uh, uh, is not known. Uh, the question is about, uh, uh, about this. Have they taken into consideration that uh, coralligenous uh, can develop under particular conditions? So, Uh, are these areas that are that uh, are actually uh, a gap of knowledge where there is a gap of knowledge are they suitable or offer uh, sites that can be uh, have they taken into consideration the kind of um, uh, of bottoms and conditions that that uh, are present in these areas because uh, in some cases uh, actually we have a gap of knowledge but in other cases uh, uh, places that are devoid of dots can result from the actual absence of coralligenous Um, um, Christina, do you have understood the, the, the questions so and so? I think, I think my, my interpretation just to, to uh, How to solve this bit. problem? No, because uh, Antonietta, the, 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 the signal many times was uh, lost and then maybe, maybe the question could be um, 
this is database collect all the actual available information. Many times this information could be updated or it probably there is a need to check if some areas where the um, habitat is described are actually also actually um, hosting the habitat also maybe this this period I don't know I think that this could be the um, and then if I think that I think that in your database you have not only the, the information about the distribution and the status but also the years of reference and then uh, uh, it is possible uh, know if the information is quite uh, dated or uh, new yeah there are I think that there are two things uh, one is that we have we should consider that the um, the database that we have we show you the records that we have now upload M most of them comes from the literature the, the the papers so we lack there is an important lack of information from technical reports great literature so we need this information because it's not there all the information it's the information that we have been able to find them so um, no in in abstracts in proceedings in whatever but there are so a lot of uh, technical um, reports that have really nice information that uh, it it should be really nice to have there this is from one side on the other side the, the data from the presence from the, the year, no, from the year, but we don't have data from the absence because it's a, it's a, the database has, has quantitative data in the positive way. The things that it's related a little bit what you mentioned probably, Antonieta, is what we are doing with um, Laura, who is behind here, who is working with the database, that, that you can use this information uh, to, to make some predictive models, putting all the information that you have, putting some information that uh, experts know that it was present but now it's not present, but this is more complex. So the, the database has, has uh, positive information, so presence. Not presence, uh, uh, current presence, but, but he, but the intention was to build a really good picture from what we have, what we had, no? probably what we have now is different, but it's lacking a lot of information from different, from different regions, of course, that I show you in the map, but also from different sources of information that we don't have. We, we have not, uh, um, it's not, they, they're not available. So we need, th this is why we think that it's important this collaborative effort between all of them, because all the people now who is, what is the paper, the information that, or, or, the, or the expert information that, that is in the, in, in the different specific area. But because as you mentioned, it's really different, the distribution of the coral genomes around the Mediterranean Sea. So, yeah, I think that I tried to answer your question. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> totally yeah, or partly. Yes, uh, yes, you did. And um, uh, my question was also forced by the absence of uh, uh, red dots along the southern coast of Sicily, where I really don't expect to uh, meet coralligenous bottoms because I think the geological situation is uh, a bit different than other sites of Sicily. So uh, probably this uh, absence could be actually a real absence. I don't know really, but it could be. Uh, Did you understand my... Yeah, 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 uh, a little bit. <laughs> but I think that this is really interesting to work with people working in uh, specific areas to know the reality of the data, what is behind. Another problem is that when we found with the coralligenous species, probably we, are, we, we found some things that species related to coralligenous, but not the coralligenous assemblage as per se. So we have to, to think to this, uh, we have to take it uh, in account also. I think that it's important. Mm -hmm. But the vision of the region, of the different regions and the information that you, you have, 
all the people here have with from the different sites is very welcome and I think that it's needed to, uh, to have a broad picture. Thank you, Antonieta. Thank you to you. Okay, thank you. Um, in, from, from the organizer, it said me that we are able to solve the problem, the technical problem for the previous presentation, and then we can ask uh, uh, Madame Canem to... Rakia, sorry. Rakia Ayeri Kliti, sorry, uh, to do the presentation from remote, uh, online, um, and then please, you have the floor. Okay, Rakia? Oui, I'm here. Yes. Okay, I will show your presentation and uh, you have to make the speech. Okay? Okay. You can go. I have to make a speech with my. Uh, okay. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, all those who contribute to the success of this Mediterranean Symposium and to thank uh, also all those who give us the opportunity to share such works. Uh, I will uh, give uh, some light insights on the biodiversity of Coragile genus and dark habitat from northern Tunisia focusing on uh, bryozoans. Uh, generally, uh, Tunisia and bryozoans diversity is poorly studied. Uh, Dantan Mascaret in 2004 recensed only 201 species. More uh, recently, some uh, works of me, of course, and some collaborators added uh, about 20 species to the previous inventory. Most of them are from Coraligenus and the Algal Association of uh, the Gulf of Tunis. Uh, pointing on uh, caves, only five species were known from six Tunisian caves. We aim in these contributions to enhance our current knowledge about Tunisian bryozoans and other Calcaris benthic organism acting as a substrate from coral genus and from red color habitats by assessing a first overview mostly of biodiversity from overhangs of Cap Negro and from coral genus bottom in front of Cabon Peninsula. For that, some materials were taken by diving in uh, some uh, red color habitats uh, from the Cap Negro overhang. As uh, you see, uh, the samples is dominated by uh, bryozoans. Those uh, species are uh, cemented with uh, uh, scleratinians with the uh, serpulids and vermets tubes, also with uh, brachiopods and with uh, calcarian uh, sponges. In addition, materials were taken uh, in front of uh, Hawaria from Coraligines bottom at uh, 30, 38 meters. As you can see, the materials is uh, mainly dominated by algal lamina and by uh, bryozoans. The bottom facing surface of an algal lamina is very colonized by circulids and uh, bryozoans. Passing to results and some new phonistic data from Cap Negro overhang, starting with the brachiopods, two species of brachiopods. Joania Gordata and La Casella Mediterranea were reported from Tunisian water for the first time. Passing to Bryozoans, the cyclistone Plagiosia sarniensis, uh, its presence, the presence of Plagiosia sarniensis 
is uh, confirmed by uh, these uh, contributions. Crazy Marginatella Matilde, recognized by its vicarious avicularia with narrow down curved micro, is, uh, uh, as you see here, by the white or uh, rose, is uh, overgrowing uh, Cribliraria radiata. The identity of uh, Prinancia inermata. Inerma uh, needs to be confirmed because it's uh, present features, not previously uh, morphological features, not previously seen in the genus of Prenancia. It has, for example, a suboral and perforate area closely granular and has a very large lateral areolar and frontal pore. Microporella appendiculata previously known from dark habitat, is here extending for, for the first time its geographic distribution to the southern coast of the Mediterranean basin. Here we, we, we can see a special competitions resulting in the overgrown of uh, uh, the Brazilian species Cribrillaria radiata, by the dominate calcarian sponges. Herbacea carbacea uh, is a uh, flusteridae. Uh, species of this uh, family are not uh, completely calcified, never completely calcified, they keep uh, flexibility. Uh, the presence of this uh, species in the Mediterranean is uh, questioned by many authors because it could be confused with its similar species, uh, Chartella paperea. Despite we demonstrate that uh, uh, we show and we gave some morphological features in previous work, uh, features which differentiate this uh, species from Chartella paperea, we need to compare uh, these materials with the tip um, materials to uncertain the cone specificity because uh, the description of the species and of many species of the same family was not uh, detailed. Finally, this study provides preliminary, uh, preliminary information about coral genus and red, uh, red coral habitat from the southwestern Mediterranean, given insight mainly on bryozoan and brachiopods diversity. Preliminary res results from, the, from, uh, from some small calcareous fragment produce uh, here a significant addition to brachiopods and bryozoan diversity of the Tunisian water. This point, the need of focusing on those still under studied ecosystem and uh, their underestimated biodiversity. Brio, uh, zones appear here, as it was known by many other previous war, to be the most diverse skeletonized organism in both key habitats. These contributions come to fill some gaps concerning the coralogenous and the calcareous habitats in the south coast of the uh, Mediterranean basin. This is, is required for biodiversity monitoring and conservation planning. Thank you for your attentions. Merci, Thank you. Um, there is a time for a question on this um, presentation. Any question from the floor? If not, we can thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Aira Kliti. Uh, we can thank you. Thank you. We can move to the general um, discussion if there are. Any other consideration? Yes. Just uh, to
two or three minutes if, if there are some synthetic consideration about <laughs> this first part of uh, if not we probably can move uh, to the following session and then thank you very much So we move to the next uh, session concerning assessing conservation statue and processes in the coral regions. So Hussein and Yasin, please. So the session will be shared by Mr. Hussein Bazeri and the reporter will be Yasin Ramzi Sahir. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, so I will move to the first part of uh, session two uh, related to assessing conservation status and processes in the coral genus. Uh, we have uh, before the coffee break uh, four presentations and we'll start with the first one uh, titled the coral genus and other Calcareous bioconcretion within the integrated monitoring and assessment program of the Mediterranean Sea and Coast. And this uh, oral presentation will be uh, presented by uh, Sylvia Kipson. You have the floor. Good afternoon to all of, all of you, and thank you, Ratspa, once again for the organization and for reminding me that I'm again four years older, so maybe we should do this more often, you know, so pa time does, doesn't pass so, <laughs> so quickly. Okay. Okay, so now we will speak uh, about uh, calcareous bioconcretions within, within the IMAP. So to recap for those of you that might not be so familiar with uh, the integrated monitoring and assessment program that I will refer to as IMAP. It's the uh, well, program uh, of uh, Barcelona Convention Ecosystem Approach Process that it's designed to uh, monitor 11 ecological objectives in an integrated manner. And actually these uh, ecological objectives uh, to the largest extent actually uh, correspond to the descriptors of uh, Marine Strategy Framework Directive that maybe we are more familiar, familiar with uh, in the European Union. And the main objective of IMAP is actually similar, and this is to assess the environmental status in relation to good environmental status across the Mediterranean Sea, so it's really broad context, and to take measures to achieve it or to maintain it. This work uh, that uh, we have collaborated in uh, is uh, done in the scope of the European-funded project uh, IMAP MPA, and here we are actually focusing on one of these uh, ecological obje objectives related to biodiversity. Uh, within these ecological objectives, we are uh, aiming to assess the implementation status of two uh, common indicators, which are related to marine habitats. And that is habitat distributional range, which also considers habitat extent, 
and condition of the habitats typical, habitats typical species and communities. Moreover, uh, we focus on uh, elaboration of key implementation elements, which are scales of monitoring, that refers to actually spatial and temporal resolution of monitoring that is being uh, carried out. Scales of assessment, which is scale at which determination of whether this uh, just good environmental status has been achieved or not. Assessment criteria, so criteria which we use to assess whether we have achieved it or, or not. Thresholds and baseline values. In this contribution, we focus on uh, coralligenous and uh, other bioconcretions, which are algal platform streams, vermitid reefs, cladocora, cespitosa reefs, and uh, rhodolid beds, with coralligenous, of course. Our methodological approach actually uh, well, included the extensive literature review. So, yes, we, we were looking at the national level, so we were, we were interested in all of the monitoring programs that are happening on the national level. And uh, with this information be, being really not detailed enough in many documents, uh, actually one of the essential parts of our methodology was a consultation, consultation process with uh, national experts, which are involved either in the implementation of IMAP or European directives uh, or are uh, specialist in uh, certain marine habitats that we were looking for. And, uh, well, we realized that uh, many gaps uh, in data remain to be completed, but still uh, we can uh, show and summarize the results that we got so far. So, related to the implementation status for uh, uh, common indi indicator one, which is related to habitat distributional range and extent, Actually, we can see that uh, the, most monitor, the um, habitats most monitored by majority of contracting parties are actually coralligenous and, uh, uh, and um, rhodolid beds, which are marked here by a star above. And the same was actually the true for uh, the other common indicator, which relates to condition of uh, habitats typical species and communities. So again, uh, more than 50% of contracting parties are monitoring or are, or are planning to monitor coralligenous and rhodolid beds. Here I also have to point out that for Cladocora cispitosa reefs, uh, actually the only country that is planning to do some monitoring on the national level is Tunisia, but we could not retrieve uh, any more data and details on this, so basically we cannot uh, elaborate more on Cladocora cispitosa reefs at this moment. Furthermore, regarding the common indicator one, the key elements, implementation elements that we were looking for related to scales of monitoring, actually we discovered that they are very rarely, uh, rarely defined, so this uh, information was really hard to uh, find. But regarding the scales of assessment, it usually always refers to coastal territorial waters, which might be further subdivided if uh, some monitoring was taken uh, carried out in the scope of uh, European directives. Related to assessment criteria, we may define it as uh, the extent of loss of habitat type, which results, results from uh, anthropogenic uh, pressures or physical disturbance, but the thresholds, so like for example maximum allowable extent of habitat that is being lost or disturbed as a proportion of the total natural extent of a certain habitat in a specified area has not been uh, defined by any of the contracting parties. So this is something that we completely have no information on. Related to the baselines, yes, mostly they're operational ones with rare av availability of historical ones, so the ones that could be maybe uh, uh, indicative of really pristine state. When we look at the algal platforms uh, more closely, we can see that uh, six contracting parties are uh, planning or carrying on the monitoring uh, on uh, this habitat. Here you can see on the map that uh, Spain is indicated with a star, and this is because um, uh, the situation in Spain is that uh, they are, for example, um, carrying out extensive carlit which is the method that uh, uses uh, cartography of uh, mid-littoral and infra upper in infralittoral uh, zone. And within that, uh, you can get uh, 
uh, useful information on habitat extent of algal platforms, but uh, we could not confirm that uh, in Spain they are actually also following the condition of the main bioconstructor, which would be the you know, main algal species building these uh, algal trotors. Uh, when it comes to the spatial scale, uh, well, for most of these habitats, uh, the usual would be to select up to 10 monitoring sites with the rare exceptions, for example, uh, for, uh, well, this is for algal platforms, but I speak also of the other habitats because I will not have the time to show them all. But for example, for um, coralligenous, uh, the exception is really Italy and France, which are carrying out the monitoring on more than 100 sites. 36 are initially planned for monitoring in Croatia, but uh, this is under revision now, so we will see what happens. And also, in, well, uh, uh, one other uh, exception is the rhodolith beds, which are monitored, which, whose condition is monitored at at least uh, 30 sites in Italy. So I would say Forza Italia, we should follow your lead because uh, you are definitely at the moment, uh, and according to the available information, leading in the monitoring of um, calcareous bioconcretions that we have considered. Uh, related to the spatial uh, temporal scale, uh, most, most often it was reported as um, uh, well, monitoring happening every two to three years, but sometimes it was ev even on the yearly basis, and in many cases it was not uh, defined and it was hard to find this information. Uh, when it comes to assessment criteria and thresholds for algal uh, platforms or RIMS, you know, we could ident identify as assessment criteria percent cover of a live algal bioconstructor constructor, sorry, in comparison to the total cover. But again, uh, no clear uh, thresholds has been established. As an uh, example, we can um, well, indicate that Malta in their reports considered uh, more than 70% of a live algal cover being indicative of undisturbed condition, but they also acknowledged that there was a lot of spatial variability between sites that they have monitored and uh, you know, further underlying uh, reasons for that should be uh, investigated. When it comes to baselines, there are some baselines available. 50% of uh, contracting parties actually reported the existence of them. Looking at vermitid reefs, there are three countries actually uh, that are uh, well, planning or monitoring uh, vermitid reefs. This is Lebanon, as we have heard from Ali's uh, presentation earlier on, uh, Israel, and Tunisia, which is planning to carry out this monitoring. Assessment criteria that we could identify is actually the ratio of dead versus alive individuals of each vermitid species. But again, uh, well, we have to take into con consideration these uh, regional specificities. As we could see maybe in Lebanon, you know, uh, even a low uh, uh, density of uh, alive dendropoma would be considered as indicative of a good state of vermitid reefs. When, I don't know, in some examples in Ita Italy, we have really high density. And I mean, we should look more closely into uh, underlying uh, well, factors and pressures that are actually uh, going on in different uh, regions and areas of uh, Mediterranean. But no really clear thresholds have been established for this habitat as well. And then we have something completely different in coralliginous. Well, uh, as I said, it's one of the most monitored or planned to be monitored uh, habitat. But clearly ongoing monitoring for coralliginous uh, at this point, uh, only five contracti contracting five countries can report. But when it comes to assessment criteria, you can see that we can uh, list at least like nine ecological indices that, has been that have been developed in the past 10 years. So we have really, in this regard, uh, well, I mean, we have made a great progress huh? because uh, we can define the thresholds, even the thresholds for different uh, environmental states. For rhodolith beds, again, uh, around uh, 10, 10 countries are monitoring or planning to monitor, with four countries really with ongoing uh, activities uh, currently. As an assessment criteria, again, we could define uh, live dead rhodolith ratio, live rhodolith percentage cover, and important one is the change in the composition of the macrobenthic community to be really able to assess uh, potential negative uh, uh, changes or um, uh, disturbances uh, acting upon this uh, habitat. 
again, don't, no defined uh, uh, good environmental status uh, class boundaries for these descriptors, although in the literature at least some indication was given by Basso and collaborators by saying that, uh, well, threshold of 50 or above uh, percent surface cover of dead rhodolites could be already considered as a condition to identify, well, a rhodolite bed not in good state, dead, or uh, its fossil counterpart. Part. Baselines for this habitat are scarce. Well, in conclusion, we could, uh, well, remark uh, certain progress definitely in the monitoring of these uh, calcareous bioconcretions, but also important uh, gaps remain. One thing was uh, that really by searching the literature and even in the consultation process, uh, it was not always easy to find and identify maybe the right people that could have the whole, that could provide the whole picture of the monitoring that is happening on the national level. And we definitely have to improve channels and communications to share the information that are relevant to the implementation of the, uh, these uh, two uh, common indicators that we were following. Also, I mean, some of the things are uh, well known for a while, but uh, we need to establish methodological standards to be really able to collect uh, coherent data sets and to be able to you know, uh, further analyze and see what is happening at the Mediterranean level. Some uh, information systems exist, but they are not used enough. Again, yes, one of the things is to enhance habitat uh, mapping efforts. We know that for some parts we are of the Mediterranean, we are fairly well covered, but in general, this, uh, uh, in, uh, these efforts really have to be improved. And these uh, reporting formats can be adjusted to also uh, take the benefit from all of the other monitoring activities that are happening in the scope of different uh, either directives or monitoring programs. Uh, yeah, uh, one other thing is to define clear thresholds for achieving JES, both for habitat distributional range and extent and condition of typical, typical species and communities other than coralliginous, I mean, of course, uh, any other work in coralliginous is more than welcome, but we really need this for other calcareous bioconcretions on the Mediterranean level. And even for the existing uh, ecological indices, although it's already a great job, we still have to do a lot with validation and intercalibration of these indices among different uh, regions of the Mediterranean. Well, I thank you for your attention. If you have any comments uh, and you are not able to tell them now, please uh, contact me or uh, Kim, uh, we would love to hear from you. I'm here till the end of the conference, so it would be great to maybe get some feedback if you know something that, uh, or you heard something that differ from your own experience and you would like to share it or indicate maybe some other potentially good sources of information. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia, for this uh, very good presentation. So the floor now is to the audience. If you have any comments, uh, questions, we have time for one or two questions. You have the floor, please. Yes, <laughs> Mr. Atia. Thank you for this uh, important uh, presentation on uh, IMAP. Uh, I would like to know whether your work, your, uh, the, the information you gathered is based on uh, field visits or field work or just by uh, bibliographic uh, information? Okay, so the information that we uh, collected is uh, based on really extensive literature reviews. So we have looked, you know, at all of the available in literature, so national technical reports, national monitoring, uh, uh, strategies, which thanks to RATSPA, I have to say, nine countries now have uh, really produced the documents uh, with IMAP uh, well, monitoring protocols, but they also vary in uh, level of uh, details that they're providing. You know, sometimes when we were looking at the really specific details, for example, on how many monitoring sites are being uh, planned or uh, where monitoring is implemented in a certain country for a certain habitat or when, when the implementation start, did it start? I mean, is it only planned or it's really ongoing? Uh, what is the temporal scale? assessment criteria, whatever, this was really, really difficult to find from the literature. 
And then uh, this consultation process with the national expert was really essential. But even then, it's not even it's not easy to identify all of the people that uh, my, may uh, have the relevant information because sometimes, you know, people, for example, working in uh, marine strategy or something, I mean, they are dedicated to a certain part of the process, but they're not, they don't have the overall picture. So uh, there were many, many issues. It was not easy to retrieve the data, but okay, we, we really tried as, uh, uh, as, as much as we could. And uh, of course, this is a work that could be upgraded uh, later on, but this is also the first assessment of this uh, kind. So I think it's a good starting point for later on. Thank you very much for your effort, because uh, as you know, the uh, monitoring uh, implementation has uh, just started in the south part of the Mediterranean, yeah. so in, uh, uh, according to the IMAP. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, your conclusions and recommendations are very much appreciated. Thank you. Well, thank you. That's good. Feedback. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Atia. Any other comment? Yeah, please. We'll go for another question. Hi. Hi. And I'm here. On the left. OK. <laughs> On the other side. Okay. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you know if already exists some intercalibration exercises about indexes of coral legions? I mean, about carlit or other indexes such as prey for coastal habitats already exist some intercalibration exercises. Do you find out something? Did you find out something about coraliginous? Uh, I mean, exist many indexes to evaluate the ecological status of coraliginous. Did you find if already exists some intercalibration uh, exercise about that? Yeah, 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 yeah. So definitely there are some intercalibration. I don't remember now exactly from which indices, but definitely there is published literature on uh, some intercalibration exercises between a uh, so couple of uh, indices, uh, ecological indices used for coral indigenous. But again, uh, they're um, uh, fairly narrow in the geographical scope, you know. So for example, we have it, I don't know, maybe from Italy or whatever for certain parts, but not from the other parts of the Mediterranean. So. I mean, some work has been done and it has to be acknowledged because it's great, but, you know, there is still uh, things to do, huh? so we can keep ourselves busy. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much. We yeah. have time for one... Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so then, uh, thank you, uh, Sylvia. So, uh, the secretariat tell me that, uh, yeah, we can applaud her. <laughs> the, the program second uh, presentation, I think uh, we have not the person online. Yes. We have it online, no? No, no, no. no okay. So, we'll move uh, directly to the third uh, presentation. Uh, and the third, monitoring coralogenous reefs in Italian coastal waters within the Marine Strategy Framework Directive and will be presented by Martina Radi Scioli. Martina, you are. Good evening. So, fix it, please. I will so Ma I will just ask you kindly ask you to speak uh, slowly yes. because with Sylvia it was uh, <laughs> speedy and uh, for the translator yeah they were uh, thank you very much Uh, we are going to talking about uh, uh, coral legions in the Italian implementation of the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, the Italian monitoring activities, uh, technological tools for data acquisition and sampling method, the ArcGIS Pro tool for data processing, 
the preliminary results of the first cycle of MSFD discussion and conclusion. Coralliginous reefs are one of the key endemic marine biogenic assemblages of the Mediterranean Sea, supporting a high level of biodiversity. Um, however, they are uh, also one of the most vulnerable and sensitive habitats to uh, multiple anthropogenic pressures, uh, direct and indire indirect ones. Hence, the need, the need to uh, implement activities to um, investigate the condition and uh, the distribution of uh, the coralliginous uh, reefs in order to promote uh, its protection. Um, at the European level, uh, at the uh, European level, uh, the, marine, the Marine Strategy Framework uh, Directive uh, promotes an integrated approach uh, to, um, uh, to, uh, uh, to define the condition of the coralliginous uh, habitat. Uh, the, the activities of the, of the marine strategies made it possible to assess the distribution of the condition and the condition of the coralliginous uh, uh, reef and the pressures to which they are exposed uh, in the studied areas, linking three MSFD uh, descriptors, uh, namely D1, biodiversity, D6, seafloor integrity, D10, marine litter. Uh, these uh, descriptors are considered together in the Italian context to assess uh, the, the, um, the health status of the coralliginous uh, habitat. Um, uh, MS, MSFD, um, uh, um, M, uh, the Marine Strategy Framework uh, uh, Directive uh, demand that each state uh, have to uh, implement, uh, have to, um, uh, so um, the Marine Strategy Framework Directive uh, demand that each state have to implement a specific protocol of uh, monitoring and measures. Uh, the, um, uh, regarding the Italian uh, approach, um, uh, um, a program of monitoring uh, was developed uh, by the use of uh, um, innovative instruments. Uh, the, the monitoring activities were conducted by the ARPA, ARPA staff uh, in each Italian region where the presence of coralliginous was known. The morphological and the bathymetric data acquisition uh, were uh, carried out using two sophisticated sonar, namely multi-beam echo sonar and the side scan sonar, uh, allowed, that allow to obtain accurate tight resolution uh, three-dimensional maps of the seabed. Uh, uh, ROVs are used for uh, for um, height resolution, for carried out height resolution and, ge and geo-referenced photo-video acquisition. Uh, the through the uh, analysis of the images, uh, it was possible to uh, acquire uh, parameters to define uh, the, the extent and the condition of the coralliginous habitat. Uh, in the monitoring protocol, uh, the sampling methodology um, consists of identifying 25 square kilometers areas uh, based on bibliographic data uh, within 12 uh, miles uh, from the Italian coast and or 100 meters depth. Uh, in each area, three sites were identified and uh, in each of them, uh, three 200 meters long transect were uh, carried out on the coralliginous uh, reef. Uh, in each transect, uh, video photographic data were collected to define the extent and the location of the coralliginous, um, coralliginous reef. Uh, in, the monitoring, uh, in this monitoring uh, protocol, uh, several environmental and biological parameters were considered, such as uh, exposition and slope, sedimentation cover, depth, bottom type, uh, presence of coralliginous sensu stricto, 
species richness and uh, diversity. Uh, and in addition, the quantity, the composition and the spatial distribution of marine litter and uh, its impact on habitat forming uh, species were assessed, uh, such as entanglement, epibiosis and uh, necrosis. The tabular and uh, cartographic uh, data acquired uh, were organized within a geo database uh, in the ArcGIS uh, environment um, uh, the, um, to, to, organize, uh, to organize data and uh, to provide an important tool for data storage, organization, and management. The geo database uh, um, contains a total of 74,820. Um, and 21 uh, records uh, um, and uh, is populated by four feature data set and several feature classes uh, related to the related to uh, related on all uh, area sites and transect data um, the the geo database uh, is uh, is populated also uh, from several object classes related to uh, the environmental and biological parameters the collecting data uh, was, uh, were uh, or, um, edited and validated uh, by the Italian Institute for uh, Environmental Research and uh, Protection. Uh, so, what were the results of the force monitoring cycle? Uh, between 2015 to 2019, 73 areas, 214 sites, uh, six and 620 transects belonging to the three sub-regions of the Mediterranean Sea were uh, monitored for a total of 62 2,000 uh, square meters of explored seafloor. The higher, nu the higher numbers of sites um, monitored in the Western Mediterranean subregion is explained by the, um, the, the greater presence of uh, coralligenous uh, uh, reefs areas, uh, while the sub bottom uh, main mainly characterize the uh, Adriatic Sea. Uh, in the survey areas, 22 target species uh, were, uh, were re recorded and uh, quantity and um, uh, morphological parameters uh, were, um, were uh, collected. Uh, five demosponges, 15 antozones and two gymnolemata. Uh, the most abundant and uh, occurring uh, target species uh, were, uh, were um, are uh, uh, confirmed to be uh, Paramulicea clavata and uh, Eunicella cavolini. Uh, overall, uh, the um, 4,316 litter items were recorded in the three sub-regions of the Mediterranean Sea, and the most common category uh, was uh, artificial polymer uh, materials. Um, um, however, art artificial polymer uh, um, um, includes uh, fishery related uh, litter, uh, mainly lines, ropes, and uh, nets uh, that are uh, the most common litter type uh, that affecting uh, the rocky reefs uh, in uh, almost uh, all monitored areas, particularly in the Western Mediterranean Sea. Uh, the entanglement was not recorded in all regions, so um, it was not considered in this uh, analysis. So. Uh, in conclusion, we can say that uh, the geo database, so the creation of a reference archi uh, archiving system in the ArcGIS environment, uh, derived by com uh, combining uh, um, uh, geo technology with uh, geomorphological analysis, uh, is a powerful tool for archiving and analyzing uh, environment environment benthic habitats. Um, uh, besides, the study provides a baseline for uh, replicas over time in the coming. Um for a replicas uh, over time. Okay, thank you. 
Non. <laughs> Thank you. For replicas over time in the coming years, uh, to, uh, for applying the multi-parameter index mesophotic assemblages conservation status to define the environmental status, uh, for more in-depth assessment of the ecological status of the coralliginous, and this study is full in line with the Barcelona Convention ECAP and AMAP guidelines. Lastly, this integrated approach will provide important feedback on extent and health condition of this habitat and evaluate the need of new management measures. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you, Martina, for sharing uh, uh, with us uh, uh, what is uh, done in terms of monitoring uh, in Italian coastal waters in the framework of the Marine Strategy Framework Directive. Uh, and we have, uh, yes, we have uh, time for two, three comments, discussions. Yeah, please. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, first, what is the depth range of the, the Corey Genus uh, monitor? Yes. And then, did you monitor the fish assemblages during the survey? Because fish assemblages are part of the seascape and are part of the functioning and can be a good uh, descriptor. Uh, yes, for the first question, uh, the range um, uh, were uh, between uh, uh, 40 meters to 130 meters. And the second question was? About the fish uh, community in the coral genus. Uh, the did you consider the fish during the no, survey? Not in this study. Not in this study. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, um, Maya Four. I had a question concerning the target species. How were they selected? It's a little bit going towards a question that had been um, asked before. Are there only Gorgonians? What are the target species and how were they selected? Uh, so the, the, the target species are uh, the most uh, charismatic uh, species uh, of the coralliginous reef. And um, uh, usually they are called uh, ecosystem engineers because uh, uh, create uh, um, three-dimensional environment. environment uh, so um, uh, they um, uh, involve the, the habitat in more uh, microhabitat and uh, uh, more uh, specific diversity. And uh, with their branches, uh, they uh, they can t they can uh, um, give refuge to the other uh, uh, species. So this is your function in the religious reef. Uh, they they um, they have more uh, more importance for this reason. Okay. Is it also because we can identify them easily? on video and images? Yes, yes. Okay, and just a last question. As I understand, Italy is actually uh, in the capacity of um, drawing a first uh, a map of the coralliginous around Italy? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, is yeah, it? Yes, we are working on this. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, just to be sure, uh, is the idea to come back to all the sites every five years? The idea is to come back on each site every five years? 
too. <laughs> if the do you plan? To if you apply to do the monitoring each five years. Uh, yes. Yes. It is, uh, yes. The working protocol provide that this uh, monitoring uh, uh, have to. Um, have to have to do every five years. Okay. And do you know the, the cost of the program? Uh, what? The, do you know how much does it cost? Uh, I don't did, know. No. <laughs> Thank you. Is there, Is there any comments? Oh. Other questions, please, from the audience. From an online. We have time. So maybe we will let it in the discussion at last. At least, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and Dirk Kriti will move to uh, uh, I will invite uh, Mr. Massimo Ponti uh, to present us uh, uh, his presentation on the ecological status of the Ligurian colorigenous habitat assessed by the Medsense Index. You have the floor. Thank you, Chair. Massimo. Okay, thank you. So I, I, actually, the, the, the good sea is just an excuse because we are here. But, but I'm, I'm going to show you uh, another, a completely different approach to monitor uh, our coralligenous habitat uh, through the, the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, uh, you know, uh, this habitat uh, is threatened by multiple stressor, uh, some People talk about that uh, today, but uh, you, you will see something more, uh, especially tomorrow morning. Uh, here just some example of the major treats uh, like uh, uh, eight waves uh, or mochi legends or, or invasion of uh, uh, non-indigenous species. Uh, so we really need uh, a, a huge effort to monitor our indigenous habitat and uh, uh, the United Nations, SPARAC, uh, and, the EU, uh, and the European community uh, strongly asking for engage and involve the citizens in uh, uh, co-design, co-creation processes in, 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 in everything, in, in monitoring, in conservation and management of uh, our habitat. So uh, the, the idea is uh, to involve people in, in this uh, very huge effort uh, but uh, uh, for, for many people, uh, the, the, the word citizen science uh, are mainly associated uh, with education, uh, rising awareness, uh, and not really uh, to profit uh, for uh, uh, true and effective data collected uh, using uh, uh, not uh, specialized people, uh, not biologists. Well, uh, the data collected by volunteers are used for, actually for specific local purposes, but are still large and exploited for uh, ecosystem-based management uh, and regional studies, except uh, some uh, very nice experience uh, carried out, uh, for, for, for instance, uh, in the MPA Engage project, uh, led uh, by uh, Kim, and uh, I know some people in, in, in this uh, room participated in. Uh, actually, in, in the Mediterranean Sea, at least, uh, we, we really uh, are in late in, uh, in uh, apply this kind of, of approach. Uh, so the, the basic idea uh, is uh, uh, to bring together uh, scientists, of course, managers that uh, are, are claimed to apply uh, monitoring and management uh, strategies and also citizens. In this particular case, uh, we are uh, looking uh, to uh, divers, but also uh, snorkel and, and free diver, not, not only scuba diver. Um, and the, the idea is uh, to, to figure out uh, which kind of data can, can be effectively collected uh, 
by people and uh, how can we use this data uh, in a scientific way uh, and, and useful for uh, true monitoring and, and management. Otherwise, uh, we are wasting our time, so we are just uh, collecting uh, information. That is important too, eh? <laughs> I don't want to, to minimize this aspect, of course. So we profit uh, of uh, the International Network uh, Reef Check uh, MED, uh, that is an a international network of volunteers uh, uh, proud to collect data uh, to uh, protect and save uh, uh, the most important environment for them, so the, the, the Mediterranean Sea, of, of, of course. Um, they are collecting data about uh, the abundance of uh, some target species selected many years ago. Uh, indeed, 43 uh, target species, uh, not all of them strictly related to coralliginous, to, to be honest. Um, and they collect data on the abundance using uh, classes of abundance, uh, depth distribution, and even absence, because for, for the species intentionally researched, uh, the volunteers also provided the, the, the absence of, of these uh, uh, target species. So basically, the, the, the protocol, the standard protocol applied by uh, these people uh, have some uh, peculiarity. Uh, all volunteers that apply the protocol are well trained to do that. Uh, they have uh, very well-defined goals. They are using uh, a standard protocol. Uh, this protocol include uh, some quality check procedure, uh, starting from uh, the training, the exams, and uh, um, continuous check of the data they, they collect. Uh, have no boundaries, so is aimed to, to the whole Mediterranean Sea. Uh, and provide, uh, that is very important, open access data, uh, and the protocol itself is uh, self-sustainable, uh, don't require money from the government, for instance, uh, and uh, is planned to be everlasting, so uh, forever. Uh, the data sharing policy is very fair, I mean, the data completely adhere to the uh, fair the data principle, so are, they are easy findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable for every people everywhere. Uh, indeed, we, we already submitted and we regularly update the data on different uh, uh, sharing platform, in, including uh, the EMODNET uh, that uh, is then linked uh, to the European uh, uh, Ocean Biodiversity Information uh, System. Uh, so, what we did to convert this mass of data in something useful for manager uh, in uh, our countries, uh, we um, selected 25 species strictly re related to hard bottom and specifically coralliginous habitat. Uh, and based on these 25 species, uh, we did a sensitivity assessment following uh, uh, the, the original uh, approach developed by the colleague of the Marine Biological Association of UK. Uh, they basically uh, adopt the, um, the pressure uh, indicated in the marine strategy, divided uh, in uh, three main categories, physical, chemical, and, bi and biological. And for each of the 25 species, uh, we assess the sensitivity toward this kind of pressure in terms of uh, resilience and resistance to, to, to that uh, stress and combine all of these information converted in, in ranking, uh, basically. So I don't want to go into the detail uh, of the calculation, of course, and uh, I just profit to be here uh, to show you some uh, nice data from the, the Ligurian Sea, where we started to collect data uh, since the beginning of the protocol, I mean in the 2006. Of course, we have 
some year with more data than, than other. I'm not going uh, to, to uh, show you uh, analysis on, on single uh, uh, time frame, but you can do, of course, if you have enough, enough data. So what is uh, very nice, uh, and I want to let you know, uh, that uh, that, uh, that everything uh, is for free. You can uh, you have just download uh, the most updated data set from the website. Uh, use a uh, freeware uh, uh, geographic information system software that is uh, uh, QGIS. We specifically developed for you a, um, a plugin uh, that you have just to include uh, in, in, the, in the the package, and, and then. Uh, uh, you can just draw the area of your interest. Running the application, uh, the computer asks you uh, if you want to select a time frame or you are going to calculate the index on the world data available inside your area of interest, and then done, you have the, the result. In this map, you, you can see uh, this exercise uh, dividing the cost of the Ligurian Sea by municipality. Okay, it's a rough division. Uh, you can do much better, of course. And as, as you can see, and uh, as you can expect, uh, the general municipality that is very large uh, have, uh, have a, a very low performance. That is quite normal because it is a, a huge uh, town uh, that produces a lot of impact uh, at, at the sea. But if you go closer, to the, the other small municipality, you can see that some area perform better than other. And for instance, uh, at, at Albenga, where we uh, hope to have a very nice marine park, we still not have, and the performance is not so good till, till, till now. <laughs> Leonardo, look at me, uh, that, that's true. Uh, what what uh, I want to tell you, um, you can go in detail if, if you want, but uh, be careful, you need data. That's the most important things. Uh, where you have enough data beco because uh, uh, diving search uh, continually involve uh, volunteers uh, and collect data, you can run uh, the, 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 the plugin and obtain your data. Uh, what also is interesting, uh, since the score uh, uh, were attributed the basis of different kind of pressure, you can also incorporate uh, the results according uh, to the uh, physical, chemical, and biological pressure. You cannot go more in detail, of course. But uh, this can be also a good indica indication for manager on what they have to look on uh, uh, to, to find out uh, the reason for instance a bad performance uh, or a slow recovery or uh, no effect uh, of uh, uh, enforced protection and, and, and whatever. Uh, just to finish uh, this uh, uh, detailed map of the Portofino Promontory uh, Marine Protected Area, uh, we here can be more in detail uh, because we have a, a lot of data of course. Uh, the, um, the area is divided by uh, the monitoring area defined by the MPA uh, management authority. And uh, you can see, of, of course, there is area that performs better than other. For instance, if you look uh, on the top uh, uh, right plot uh, that is about physical pressure, uh, you can see the, the Mm, south east corner is, is the worst uh, corner of, of the MPA that is probably related to the uh, huge sedimentation coming from the Tigulio Gulf uh, and the river uh, present there. So just uh, to conclude, uh, MedSense is the only biotic index till now for the corrigion of habitats in the Mediterranean Sea based on citizen science data. It is suitable for local and regional uh, environmental assessment in time. You can also uh, check, for instance, uh, before and after some action. 
uh, it, it represents a bridge between uh, citizen science and, and management, of course. Provide a huge citizen awareness because all the people uh, participating are proud to do that and uh, are aware ab about the, the problem of our C and uh, seems uh, uh, an, an effective assessment tool that can be used to complement much more professional uh, <laughs> survey uh, as described, for instance, uh, by Silvia and Martina before me. Thank you so much for the attention. Thank you very much, uh, Massimo. Uh, I think we have uh, time for two or three questions before going to the general discussion about this third part of the of this session. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. For me. Yeah. Uh, thank you for this presentation. I have a question concerning you talk about uh, the absence of species. And so I'm asking how you can make the difference between uh, a real absence or just a bad identification of some species from, uh, from divers. Because I have the same problem. I, I yeah. know <laughs> citizen science. And so how you uh, can so sure that is an absence and not just a... Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty sure that the people involved are perfectly able to, to identify the species they are looking for because they are well trained, they make uh, exams uh, uh, to recognize uh, the species. Um, I, I would say most of them are, are more able than my students at the university to recognize the species. So sorry for my students, but that's the truth. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, about the absence, uh, uh, this, uh, of course, is a, a relative absence. Uh, we, uh, parameters, uh, we, we consider every information uh, just related uh, to the uh, dive performed by each single diver. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, I can uh, not see the species uh, you can, uh, at the same dive, you may have the option to, to see them. Uh, is a, a, a relative uh, inf information. Of course, uh, every instrument you are using uh, have some error, precision, and accuracy. And in, in our case, uh, the, the, the diver are our instrument. The, their eyes is our <laughs> instrument. And of course, uh, we measured the precision and accuracy of them b before use this data. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Please, you have. Uh, hello, thank you. Paolo Bernat from uh, Osservatorio Ligure Pesca Ambiente di Genova. Hi, Massimo. Uh, mm, it's not just a, a, a question, it's a consideration. In the uh, map that you showed us, I'm surprised that in an in a area between uh, Finale Ligure, uh, Western words of uh, Bergeggi and Caponoli that was marked in uh, dark green. In this area, Finale Ligure, uh, the color was uh, uh, light yellow, so moderate, uh, your index was moderate. And uh, at, in reality, uh, th there is a very, very uh, interesting area from a naturalistic uh, and uh, underwater point of view because uh, there is a in this area for the uh, composition of the rocks uh, on the on the land you have a, a characteristic uh, uh, geological formation that uh, called the um, beach rock and you have also um, different uh, posidonia meadows along the coast Okay, perhaps a little bit uh, disturbed, uh, interrupted, but uh, so I'm I astonished that uh, the yeah. evaluation by the MedSense index in this area is uh, quite uh, uh, lower. Okay, quite I, I may have an Thank explanation you. for that, uh, but uh, in, in case uh, we, we can. Uh, 
uh, later analyze data together and uh, and uh, go in deeper. Uh, as as I forget to mention, uh, in in many areas you, you see the white color. Uh, white uh, was not assessed at all, of, co of course, uh, due to lacking data. In this specific case, uh, most of the data we have uh, are not uh, on the uh, deep uh, reef you mentioned, uh, probably are only from uh, uh, along the coast. So probably to, to have an answer to your question, you have to go more in detail divided data from coastal and offshore uh, deep rocks, check if there is enough data in, in that place, uh, and, and then uh, calculate the index again. Um, anyway, uh, the index, uh, as I mentioned, use only 25 species. F for instance, we applied the index uh, in the Northern Adriatic Sea, where we have uh, some correligious bank uh, not the same in the Ligurian, but uh, uh, something that uh, we can compare. And actually, uh, there the index uh, perform a little bad uh, in general, but probably be because uh, we have few species that fit uh, such kind of habitat. Uh, for instance, in the Northern Adriatic Coralligion Bank, we completely lack uh, of uh, uh, gorgonians and uh, erect sponges. So, and the med sense use this data, uh, of course. <laughs> Thank you, Massimo, for this clarification. Tim? Yes, thank you, Massimo, for the presentation. I'm Joaquin Carrabo from the Institute of Marine Science in Barcelona. Um, in one of your slides about the pros of applying this, uh, I'm curious, uh, because I want to apply it as well myself, about the self-sustained uh, financially uh, initiative because I mean you put it there and I if it's true tell me the recipe because <laughs> I'm going to apply it to others so I think that we don't have to forget that behind all these efforts there are teams of people there are infrastructures there are um, resources that we have to put so it's not for free because the time even the volunteers, but organize the, uh, the trainings, organize, it takes, so this is something that we have to take in consideration. And the second thing that I want to say is that, uh, of course, the citizen science, I, I'm involved in this, so I completely in line on this, but uh, I, just, I, I know that you are in the same uh, uh, line of thought, but uh, I just was to uh, highlight it that we need uh, the scientific uh, monitoring as well, I mean, this is a compliment for me that it, it's really helpful and it can support many of the, our monitoring needs, but we need as well to support the, the monitoring. As we saw in the previous uh, um, presentations about the IMAP, there is a, a list from the information available. There is a, a really gap of knowledge, so we need uh, to put all the efforts there. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. I completely agree with you. I, I, I was... Uh, <laughs> uh, over-optimistic uh, <laughs> about uh, uh, the no need of uh, um, supporting for that action. Uh, actually, uh, every support is absolutely welcome. Uh, we spend a lot of uh, time as a marine biologist, uh, profiting of our position at, at the university, of course, uh, and uh, uh, use our time also, also for that, uh, and we ask for that for every uh, colleagues uh, that are willing to, to, to do that, of course, uh, like uh, you with uh, Observatory del Mar, for instance. Um, of course, uh, if there is the possibility uh, to profit from uh, funding, uh, I, I think uh, this kind of action can be uh, improved a lot in, in many, many sense. And, and about uh, the lack of, of information, we, we talk about that uh, a lot of time. Of, of course, the, um, the project proposed by Christina this morning is uh, extremely important. We have to profit of every kind of source to fill uh, the lot of gap we have in, in knowledge, even only in, in uh, the distribution of speeches, of course. Thank you for the question. Thank you, Massimo. I think uh, 
We will switch to a general discussion. Thank you. We have uh, 10 to 15 minutes before the cafe break. Uh, coffee break and uh, uh, so for the general discussion about uh, the, the, the topics that were presented in this uh, three presentation. Well, uh, as a conclusion, uh, uh, we, can, we can see that uh, evaluating the good environmental uh, status is challenging in the, at the Mediterranean region, uh, knowing that uh, one of the aim of uh, the Barcelona Convention currently is to, uh, to attempt to uh, evaluate uh, or uh, to see how to evaluate the, the good uh, environmental uh, status at the regional uh, scale. It's challenging because there's uh, different uh, efforts, different methodologies, the problem of thresholds, and uh, this is opportunity to start to exchange between us because uh, this is one of the requirements of the IMAP in the Barcelona Convention, but also for the European countries uh, in the context of many European uh, directives. So I open, uh, I give uh, the floor to Ricardo uh, to discuss about it. Yes, thank you very much, um, Ricardo Aguilar from Oceana. And well, to start the discussion, uh, the first thing that I would like to ask again and again and again is mapping, mapping, mapping because for evaluating and for assessing the, the, the coralliginous, we don't know if we are assessing only 10% of the existing one or if we are assessing 90%. That I don't think that will be 90%. Another thing that I'm missing normally in the assessment is the areas where coralliginous has disappeared because all of the information is about areas where it still exist on areas where maybe it's very low, but it still exists. And it will be very important to know also the areas where the coralliginous has already disappeared, also to have this general overview and to have the, the, a good assessment. And not only on extension, but also on depth, because something that is happening is that we are finding in, 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 in many of the researches that we are doing is that uh, similar to what is, uh, has already happened to the uh, Posidonia, the deepest range is not so deep. Every year, you know, is lower. And then we can find some areas where the coralliginous, still you have the structures, but it's dead. And maybe you have several meters of, of coralliginous mm -hmm. that is already, already uh, destroyed. And it will be very interesting also to know what is the real extent of destruction that we already have in the Mediterranean. And finally, something that always worries me and scares me is the numbers. Um, because we have been also discussing about uh, the numbers. And I know that we have to provide numbers to the managers, to the politicians, mm -hmm. but uh, please be very careful with this because it's not the same to assess a uh, coralliginous that is in front of a river mouth, the coralliginous that is in the middle of the Mediterranean mm -hmm. because the stressors are completely different, the nutrients and, and many things. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo, for this valuable comment. Any experience to, uh, to share with us in your countries about uh, what is done, what the state of art in evaluating the good environment status using the coralliginous as a proxy? Yeah, Kim, please, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Um, regarding the indicators, and uh, there were some questions about the, these different indices, and uh, these uh, last years there has been a lot of publications, or quite a lot of publications about the indices. And, uh, and with this comment by, by uh, my colleague from Oceana, um, it's true, we have to be careful with uh, providing kind of the magic number that it's telling us that this is good or this is bad. But uh, we're still in time to, to think about what is the best uh, indicator, but uh, I think that we should all agree on what are the um, measurements that we are doing in, during the surveys. Because if we 
everywhere we are doing more or less the same thing and we are getting the information about these uh, parameters, then whatever is the index that we want to use, we will be able to implement it or to calculate it uh, later. So I think that this is something that um, we have to, I mean, at least in, in, in the work that we have been doing in our team is the way that I was kind of approaching or we were approaching the problem, right? So we take pictures, for instance, okay, we can calculate extract uh, the cover of this species or the other species, but if you have the pictures and if they are in good resolution mm -hmm. and you cover a, sur a certain surface, then mm -hmm. if there is, then we discover that this is another thing that we have to calculate from the pictures, you can do it. If you don't have the pictures and you make it this by visual sensors, then you cannot com come back. So just uh, it would be good that in our community here, not today, but uh, have a discussion on yeah. how um, what could be this minimum uh, set of uh, parameters that we have to uh, gather in, in the different places? And then you can apply the indices, and then we can compare, etc. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. I totally agree. And uh, uh, moreover, we have to think about some uh, methodologies that are uh, not lot of uh, money consuming and time consuming that could be uh, used in all the country because uh, we don't have to be to do a sophisticated methodologies to have uh, uh, information who, uh, uh, as you say uh, we, if you work in the same way uh, we can have some uh, answers and some reflection at the national but also at the regional scale any other comments, please? We have uh, five minutes before the coffee break. Any problems in the IMAP procedures? Okay, is, we have um, uh, an online participant that want to ask a question. Okay. So we have uh, our colleague from Algeria side, Bill Basha, he is asking for uh, an intervention. You have uh, the floor. Si ça aide, vous pouvez intervenir. Vous avez la parole. On t'entend pas, merci. On t'entend pas, si ça aide. Merci de vérifier euh, ton micro. Non. Désolé, c'est ça aide, mais on ne t'entend pas. Il y a un problème. Toujours, toujours pas. Si ça aide, je suis désolé, on ne t'entend pas. Il y a un problème. Euh, on laisse peut-être à la session prochaine. Après cinq minutes, on, on essaiera de régler ça. OK Okay, we we break for the for the coffee, and we have the photo group. So, Dora, what is the plan now? Hey, talk. So the photo group is for now, before the coffee break.
Good afternoon to everybody. Uh, we continue the previous section uh, about uh, the conservation status and processes in the coral regions and the related habitat, I would suspect. And we have uh, five communications. So, if the first speaker is available, I would start calling Giulia Gatti. Is there any Giulia Gatti around? <laughs> I see Giulia Gatti coming. Welcome, Giulia Gatti. <laughs> Take your seat. And uh, she's going to talk to you about uh, another experience of uh, citizen science to monitor Northwestern Mediterranean coralliginous reefs. Uh, Giulia, you, you know you have uh, 15 minutes. Mm -hmm but uh, please try to leave us a couple of minutes for, answer, for a question and answers. So, okay. go. I will try. Uh, no? What's full screen? I don't know. Need to be there. Usually you, you, you can see a PDF in full screen. This is... Okay. So, uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, we are going to talk about uh, citizen science again. Uh, so, uh, citizen science uh, in the submerged marine realm is, uh, is a challenge. And uh, is even more challenging uh, when uh, its focus are coralliginous reefs. Because uh, the depth at which this uh, biocenosis uh, develops uh, requires uh, more experienced scuba divers uh, than uh, uh, shallow water reefs, for example. But at the same time, coralliginous reefs are uh, the most valued, the most popular underwater natural seascape uh, among uh, uh, recreational divers. Uh, and this means uh, thousands of pairs of eyes that can uh, observe coralliginous reefs each, each year. And this is the reason why um, in 2016, the, for Dive, the Citizen Science Project, Sieges Made for Divers, was launched by an international team in the framework of the Sieges Med project. Thank you. Um, with the aim to involve recreational divers in the scientific process of uh, monitoring coralliginous reefs uh, all around the Mediterranean Sea, but at the same time to uh, educate them to observe coralliginous uh, reefs, so they are they are a favorite favorite uh, playground uh, in a way different than usual. So not just to enjoy the view, but to, to understand what they see. Um, so we provided a simplified uh, ob observational protocol, some uh, theoretical self-training material, and uh, data uh, were shared through uh, the, the project uh, website. In France, the implementation of CGS Met for divers, divers was uh, supported uh, since its beginning by the citizen science platform uh, uh, Polaris, uh, developed by a local uh, uh, diving and scientific organization uh, uh, called Septentrion Environnement. And uh, Polaris uh, developed uh, a training process combining face-to-face uh, uh, -face, uh, um, training and, uh, and practice. Uh, it organizes three dedicated dives uh, uh, per diving season and uh, it developed a mobile application to share data because one of the uh, main problems we encountered at the beginning was that uh, divers didn't share their data. 
because uh, once at home uh, they simply forgot, I, I hope. Um, so here I don't want to, to focus uh, on the results of uh, the observations themselves, but rather on what they can suggest us about uh, uh, the implementation process, uh, its improvement, and uh, about uh, the quality of the data collected. So, um, uh, the observational protocol, uh, uh, concerning the observational protocol, um, dive, uh, uh, depth, and the sites are chosen according to uh, diverse uh, preferences. Um, each diver uh, carry out an observation over about uh, 10 to 15 minutes and covering a surface of about uh, uh, 1.5 uh, <laughs> to, <laughs> to 2 meters uh, squared meters. Um, and data collected include some uh, topographic and abiotic information uh, uh, about, uh, of the study site. Some, uh, it doesn't work as I want uh, in PDF. Um, Thank you. Um, mm, an estimation of uh, uh, the level of presence of some pressures and the immediate threats, and uh, the semi -quantitative, an estimation of the semi-quantitative abundance of uh, uh, some uh, typical conspicuous species. Uh, the study site uh, is, the, is located in southern France, in the marine uh, zone, in the marine area of the Calanque uh, National Park. And data uh, were, uh, to be analyzed, were gathered over three consecutive years in order to get enough data to compare results over time. And uh, um, uh, the analysis uh, focused on the observe on the distribution in space and time of the observations. On the, we explored the abundance and the distribution of species of taxa on some uh, uh, protected or endangered species and of pressure threats. And we compared these abundances uh, over the two periods. So, uh, between um, uh, 2016 and 2021, uh, 151 observations were collected, included, uh, including uh, about 10% uh, of uh, non-exploitable observations. And observations were uh, discarded where they, uh, the majority of the information was lacking, of, or if they contained uh, absurd data, such as, uh, for example, a dense population of uh, Savalia Savalia at shallow depth we know that was uh, Eunicella Cavolini, and so it was discarded. The majority of the sites were uh, visited uh, less than five times, and this corresponded to uh, independent dives or uh, unusual dive sites for the area. Um, the most uh, observed dive sites are those uh, that are uh, uh, the most valued uh, among uh, recreational divers for their uh, uh, the, 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 the attractiveness of, the, uh, of their seascape, or because of the accessibility according to the prevailing winds in the area. Mm, the only study site, uh, the, uh, the study site that showed the highest number of, of observations, and the only one uh, which has a, a comparable distribution of this observation uh, in the two uh, periods is uh, about the one, uh, the Farion. And uh, this is the only one which allowed uh, to start a long term monitoring of coraligenous reefs uh, in the area. Uh, as expected for the study site, uh, um, the community was dominated by Cnidarians followed by porifera and uh, uh, algae. And uh, the, um, the citizens observations uh, uh, detected the, the community stability 
that is typical of uh, coralligenous reefs. So we can't see any major differences in abundance uh, uh, between the two periods for higher taxa or for uh, endangered and protected species. The only exception is represented by porifera. But uh, rather, uh, to um, um, uh, an actual increase of uh, the target species in the area, these results uh, uh, can be traced to an improvement in the identification of Agelasoroides and of uh, the, uh, the sponges of the genus Cleona, uh, which uh, uh, as um, usual, but often, uh, uh, which was, was often problematic for uh, uh, recreational divers. They shared with us their difficulties, and so during training sessions, uh, we particularly insist on this issue, and it was successful. Um, concerning uh, pressures and threats, uh, um, organism necrosis uh, uh, resulted to be the most uh, uh, present, the most visible uh, pressure in the study site. Um, Gorgonian necrosis is, uh, is current in this area. Uh, due to uh, recurrent uh, uh, marine heat waves, but uh, uh, the impact of this event was, lim was limited during the last uh, six years, as revealed, uh, as detected by um, uh, recreational, uh, by, by the observations of recreational divers. Unfortunately, this was true uh, until uh, this year. Because uh, is since uh, a month, uh, we are facing uh, an impressive mass mortality event of uh, gorgonians and of sponges and of other organisms uh, above 30 meters depth. And this is uh, not uh, um, a population of Unicella cavolini, but it's dead Paramoricea clavata. Mm. The uh, decrease, the, the significant decrease of uh, Asparagopsis uh, is uh, not uh, is just explained by, uh, by uh, a seasonal effect. Observations during the first period were uh, uh, carried out uh, in spring or uh, early summer where uh, asparagos Asparagopsis has uh, its peak of uh, vegetative um, uh, development. Diverse recklessness and sedimentation, so, uh, and sedimentation sorry, uh, show the same identification issues that then um, porifera. But uh, this problem, uh, uh, this identification problem still persists uh, despite uh, our best effort, efforts. So from, uh, from a scientific point of view, in order to carry on, uh, carry on uh, uh, the monitoring, the long-term monitoring of coralligenous reefs, we will, oh, thank you. We, will uh, uh, we decide to focus on three dive sites and to visit them each year in the same period in order to avoid the seasonal uh, effects. But at the same time, we want to continue to in encourage uh, independent dives uh, in order to uh, in order to assure the wide-scale characterization of uh, coralligenous reefs. Um, data seems to be quite good, even if uh, uh, some problems uh, in uh, identification of some uh, elements persist. And I'm uh, really wondering if uh, it would be better to remove them from the protocol. Um, so, um, Six years after the beginning of uh, sieges met for divers in France, we can, uh, we can say that uh, its, uh, its implementation is a success and that uh, we can start, we could start uh, uh, the long-term monitoring of uh, the most frequent dive, dive site in the area. But at the same time, sieges met for divers uh, and the process uh, See, just met for divers, revealed to be a good tool to, for uh, educational and training activities, not only uh, for the marine biology, but also for the diving uh, technique itself. For example, uh, by 
improving the buoyancy of divers. We particularly insist on buoyancy during training. And so, uh, the original, I, well, we can say that the original objectives of seizures made for divers have been achieved at local scale. But uh, mm, this is uh, the result of the uh, implementation process uh, carried out by, by the platform Polaris, uh, which implied the local coordination of many different activities and different stakeholders. And uh, thanks to, to this coordination, uh, we could encourage uh, the long-term involvement uh, of participants, which is, which is the main problem uh, in uh, citizen science. But this <laughs> is uh, the, the result of a teamwork, a teamwork uh, that uh, implied uh, imply about uh, 100 days of work per year and that costs uh, about 15,000 euros per year. So uh, this is my, but the message, my my final message as uh, scientists or as uh, uh, environmental managers, we cannot think about uh, citizen science just as uh, local data. Because, but because it, this is not true, too simply. And uh, this, with this take home message, I, I thank you for, uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, Julia. I've been impressed by some of your talk and comments uh, about your work, and I think that uh, it deserves some discussion. So we have uh, two minutes uh, for a discussion. Is, is there any question from the audience? You have been too clear. Huh? Great. <laughs> oh, okay, one. From Julia to Julie. Uh, do you know how many divers are the same from the beginning to the end of uh, your program? If there is a fidelity of uh, your Oh, career? yes, I, I don't know how many. But I know that uh, uh, our, our organization has a diving center. So we, we know our divers, but I don't know how many of them are there. I know that there are uh, some new divers, some divers that give up, but uh, I don't know how many. I, 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 can't, uh, I, can, I can see and tell you. Just after. Is it easy to, to keep them? Uh, no, mobilized? it's not easy. Oh, yeah. This is the reason why I say it's not uh, low cost, but because it, uh, it requires a greater coordination effort, at least. Any other question? Thank you. I, I'm Cristina Linares from the University of Barcelona. Uh, I have a question about observation. Mm -hmm. uh, did you mention that you, you have 100, no, 150, no, 100 observations? Number. What, do you, what do you mean with observation? Observation is a transect, is a diver? No, it's just uh, an observation, but over a surface, a limited surface of about uh, 1.5 to 2 squared meters, uh, that is estimated just as the, the width of the two open arms of the, the diver. So we limit a little bit the, the, the area that is observed, uh, but uh, we don't have uh, quadrats or something like this. It's citizen science, uh, it's not uh, yeah, yeah, but, real science. But you have to take care about the depth, not? Because yes, you, the you depth fix the depth. Fixed. They choose the depth, and this, the depth is the only uh, mandatory information we ask. Without depth, I discard the observations, mm -hmm. uh, and that, uh, and that uh, at that depth, uh, they, they do their observation. Okay, thank you. Any other question? So I thank again Julia, and uh, I give uh, place to the next uh, speaker, which should be Laura Figueroa Ferrando, 
again about uh, citizen science and the Coraligenos, uh, so we can compare. Hi, good afternoon. I am Laura Figuerola Ferrando from the University of Barcelona and the Metrocover Research Group. And I'm going to talk about the solution to rapidly assess the correligionous assemblages from the Mediterranean Sea at the whole scale of the Mediterranean. And using a rapid assessment method that can be used not only for scientists, but also for citizen scientists. Our main question is how can we assess the coralliginous conservation status at the whole Mediterranean uh, basin? And um, in this context, our main, it's not working. Okay. Maybe the presentation is, yes, exactly. So now, yes, it's here. Okay, so I return to the first question, the main question, is how can we assess the coralliginous conservation status at the whole Mediterranean scale? So in this context, our main objective is to find an easy and rapid and cost-effective method that I think that in the last um, session we were talking about that in the discussion, that can be applied, of course, at broad special scales and which we can obtain a quantitative indicator. So I divide this presentation in two main parts. First, I'm going to present you the rapid assessment method, the percentage of affected colonies and how we validate it. And then the application of this method into the citizen science approach. So the rapid assessment method is a method that is based on quantifying the percentage of affected colonies um, of the same species in the same location and of course in the same depth range. And it um, divides, it classifies um, a colony between non-affected colonies if it presents less than 10% of the injured surface or affected colonies if it presents mortality. The mortality, as you know, can be recent or necrosis or old. And it can be the case that a colony presents both types of mortality in the same time. And the good uh, thing of this method is that you can translate it really easily to uh, different impact categories, moving from non-impacted populations to severe impacted populations. And this information is and you can translate it into the management bodies. Uh, how we validate this method? We um, compare it with the most common method that I'm sure every one of you knows, that is the percentage of injured surface of each colony. To do that, we use the Paramuricea clavata, the red gorgonian, as a target species. And our research group had been used and um, had been sampled seven Northwestern Mediterranean locations since 1999, and we have more than 47,500 populations, I call it colonies, sorry, and from 68 uh, sites. So we have uh, a lot of information um, with this. And um, these um, Northwestern Mediterranean locations present different thermal regimes. The results showed that both methods were highly correlated, as you see in, in this plot, on the correlation plot, and how you can translate it really easily from the percentage of affected colonies, the rapid assessment method, the impact category, um, from non-impacted populations to severe impacted populations. So now we are going to apply this method into the citizen science approach. We use the Observadores del Mar, the Sea Watchers in English, citizen science platform that um, is implemented this protocol, this rapid assessment protocol in one of the projects. So we used two sentinel observatories, which were the Club de Marcio Biologia from the University of Barcelona and Son Mar from Cap de Creus in the north coast of Catalonia. And we did different sampling campaigns. 
doing first a theoretical approach, a theoretical training, and then a practical training with all of them. So in order to see if the observers, the citizen scientists, were sampling the same as scientists, we first validate the, their data, their data quality, and we um, implemented two uh, marks in the vertical wall and to indicate the beginning of the sampling protocol. And every observer, citizen and scientist, starts the protocol in, in this beginning point and moves throughout the horizontal line, um, sampling at least 100 colonies. We used two variables to, um, to assess the, the quality data of citizen scientists. First, the percentage of affected colonies they, they assessed, they sampled. And second, the total number of sampled colonies, that it has to be at least 100. And we compare it between three different groups. First, the one-day trained volunteers. Second, the two-day trained volunteers, that were volunteers that repeat uh, in a second um, sampling campaign the, the protocol. And third, with scientists, of course. The results of the first variable, the percentage of affected colonies, are shown in this plot, where you can see every one of the observations of citizens and citizen scientists compared with the reference. This reference is the mean value of um, percentage of affected colonies of the, the scientists in that sampling campaign, and in order to compare between sampling campaigns. No? So, and here you can see that there are not statistical differences between three groups. However, you, um, the variability of the one-day trained volunteers are really high compared with other groups. So, and it's easy to see how the volunteers in only one sample really improve their sampling ability. And the, their numbers are most closer to scientists are with uh, less variability among them. In the second variable, the results of total number of sampled colonies, here um, and the volunteers did show um, statistical differences, uh, specifically between one day trained volunteers and the other um, groups of observation. And here it's easy to see how the first day that volunteers sampled, the most of them uh, sampled less than 100 colonies. And the second day, um, they, all of them except one <laughs> sample more than 100. So they really improve in only one sample the, their sampling ability, and their numbers are almost the same as scientists. So as, uh, just to conclude the take-home message, I, we want to reinforce that the rapid assessment method, percentage of affected colonies, is a robust method that can be applied not only for scientists, but also for citizen scientists. And here we apply it in the Red Gorgonian, Paramonifea clavata, but it can be also applied to other coralliginous species, not only Gorgonian, also Bryozoan or Spongy. And for example, there are species that are more difficult to implement in citizen science, but they can be implemented by scientists, of course. No, you, you have to choose between the both groups. And the most um, important thing for me is that the, this method can be easily translated to management bodies with the impact category. So it's, it's easy to, um, to take profit of, of that. And we can implement it using science and citizen science to the whole Mediterranean basin really easily. I want to thank you to my thesis directors and my, the colleagues that in my research group that helped me in the field work and other tasks. And of course, um, the citizen science volunteers from Club de Marcio Biologia and Son Mar from Observadores del Mar. And here you have my contact, just in case you have any question or you can tell in that, of course. Thank you, Laura, for your uh, speech and for staying in time. So we have plenty of time for questions. Please go, many, many questions. Well, thank you for your presentation. 
I have a question uh, about identifying uh, recent uh, necrosis because I applied the protocol uh, a week ago, I think, with citizen scientists. Uh, as I said, uh, we are facing a great uh, uh, mass mortality event. But uh, after uh, three weeks, uh, uh, naked uh, skeletons started to be colonized by a small uh, uh, algae and etc. And the divers told me, but this is not naked uh, skeleton. <laughs> and so they, they noted as an old, an ancient uh, uh, necrosis. Okay. So, how can you, how can you suggest to it improve this? Because I know that it's recent, recent yes. but they don't. Yes, no, it was difficult, but um, with training, is in this kind of um, errors of course, and um, can be solved. Um, in our case, um, we implement like a testing <laughs> video, um, like an exam, after the theoretical training. And it, this exam, they resolve a lot of doubts. But of course, um, as we make two sampling campaigns with the same volunteers, the first time, some of them, um, um, for example, they were not too close to the uh, vertical wall. They were um, like a little bit far away, or they didn't sample 100 colonies, or they were a little bit confused at the beginning. But then, as they were confused in that sampling, in the second sampling, as we corrected, they sampling uh, well. So this kind of uh, small errors can be solved in in, in the, this training. So for this, um, the expert validation and training is super important in citizen science, as you just <laughs> well, you know, of course. And, and it's, it's not easy, but it's important to have like, um, the same volunteers, because if they were trained by you or by people in charge of this project, it's easy to, you know them, and you know how they and sample or which kind of uh, mistakes can can make and you can help um, them of course with everything other questions wow one two three good afternoon i'm eduardo casoli from university of rome congratulations for your work and presentation i would like to ask you uh, did you test if uh, the experience of diver might uh, lead to difference in the accuracy of data? I mean, I, I, I don't, can you repeat, please? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, more experienced diver may ah, gather yes. more accurate data. Did you test hmm. for differences uh, among uh, experience or certification I, level? Yes, Thank I, you. we didn't. Um, we didn't test it, but all of divers um, has a, a minimum level. For as we said, 40 divers and 40 dives, and at least the uh, um, advanced or two stars of them as a level. And for us, it was like the minimum. Of course, they, they all control the buoyancy and flotability and everything. And but we didn't check if they were dive master or rescue or um, open or. Or open no, <laughs> or advanced, or something like this. But I know that there are um, different citizen science papers related uh, to, to divers that uh, did check this, and some of them did not find differences between the diving expertise, but other things uh, like the motivation of diving, of if they are in, interesting in biology or not, are most important that um, the expertise of diving. Uh, sorry, I've been instructed that uh, there is a question online, so uh, let's uh, go then first. I don't know who is talking. Is the Bacha? The Berlin. Bonjour. Yes, we listen to you. C'est Saïd Belbacha de l'Université de Annaba, en Algérie. Donc, c'est juste au sujet des, de, de ce que vous appelez science citoyenne. 
euh, que vous utilisez dans vos études. Je voudrais savoir euh, leur fiabilité et la pertinence des observations et surtout les limites, ces limites, parce que quand on parle de coralligène, on sait qu'on va assez profond. Et est-ce que ces plongeurs sportifs ou professionnels ont des connaissances euh, assez qui leur permettent de déterminer la pertinence de leurs ob observations Merci. Okay, thank you for the question and translation. Um, the, um, the divers um, at the beginning did not find, ex they don't have experience um, of this species. Some of them know it, some of them know. And some of them even didn't know that there were animals. So um, the theoretical training um, was just to introduce these, the animals, the, um, global warming and climate change problems that affect this, this uh, Nidarian species and other correlation species. And we were diving with them and in the same time. And so this train and this protocol was validated only with red gorgonian, Paramonicea clavata, in our case. Um, all of them, well, we were to the um, vertical wall of Paramonicea clavata and all of them knows which was the species because we made the theoretical training the same day. So they were um, experienced with that. And after the second, after the first training, um, some divers um, told me, okay, I'm, I'm a super experienced diver. I've been diving like um, from, I don't know, 20 years ago, and I've never been seen this mortality. And now I'm going to the sea and I'm seeing this mortality. And For me, it's the best thing that you can do with that um, the, um, divers because they have been um, diving from a lot of years and they didn't know that the coralliginous were dying um, due to um, marine heat waves. No? And I think that this is a, a really good um, for them to know the problem and because they are going to talk with their family and friends about that and they can contribute to, to science too. I think it is it's the most beautiful thing <laughs> of the... If I remember well, there are other two questions. Please, uh, time is running, so short uh, questions uh, and quick answers. Uh, yes, <laughs> I'm going to be short. <laughs> Hi, have you planned to train divers about the most critical species, I mean, Uh, among algae, the most critical alien species such as Calerpace or Sporocnus, which is destroying um, Gorgonian forest in the Adriatic Sea. Thank you. In the Atlantic Sea? No, sorry, there is a light. No, I, I mean, I, yeah. a of uh, I did an example. I mean... No, I, in this case, we only train it with the red Gorgonian and we introduced other correlationous species, but only it was an introduction and then we focus to red gorgonian. But this method has, has been applied to other species and for scientists and for citizen scientists. So we know that um, it's been doing, but we only validated with red gorgonian. So the training was focused on red gorgonian. Okay. Thank you for the question. <laughs> the last question. Um, thank you for your presentation, that was very nice. I, I must have missed something, but uh, I'm not quite sure how the 100 uh, Gorgonians will be counted, or are they along a transect? As I understood, they were on a transect when you did this um, uh, try, and yes. that's this, uh, but how will they work? after individually? Yes, it's, it's really easy. It's just to, you have a, a temple, a template, and you have four columns, and you have like the non-affected colonies, and then three columns for the affected colonies. And the affected colonies, is if a colony is affected by recent mortality, by old mortality, or a bibliosi, or by both types of mortality in the same time. So you just go to the vertical wall in the same depth, and you count, okay, this colony, it's 
affected by rest mortality, and you just put one into the rest mortality. Next colony, this is non-affected colony, okay, non-affected, and you just do did um, 100 colonies like this. For us, it's in 10 minutes, you can do a lot, and uh, one sample. It's really yeah. fast. Okay, I, I understand, but then, uh, so you have, it's, it's clearly said that you must go from one colony to the next one that's near, because we will be, people will be tempted to go to the impacted colonies. Ah, yes. Uh, that's yes. The, the, it's the uh, sampling that, uh, yes. It's on the sample. Yes. No, the idea is that um, the sample is from the um, mortality or the conservation status of the population. So you have to sample at least 100 colonies, but it's like a, to have a, an idea of the whole population in, <laughs> in that um, sampling, in, the, in that depth. But of course, if, if you sample this colony or this not and this yes, it's, a, it's okay for the method because at the end, the impact category, the um, the, you classify it in only four classes, and it's not important if the percentage of the total affected colonies is 41 or 43.5. It's well, no, okay. Yes, I have to. Okay. I think that I have to finish. <laughs> Thank you again, Laura. Thank you. Yes. And. Uh, <laughs> Now is the turn of Sandra Ramirez Calero, and we change the topic. Uh, we uh, apparently we will uh, listen about the garden experiments uh, on Paramoricea clavata and this uh, thermal tolerance. I think. Okay, um, good afternoon everyone. My name is Sandra Ramirez and I am a first year PhD student at the Institute of Marine Science in Barcelona. And today I'm going to present some preliminary results of one of my chapters uh, from my PhD. And I would like to give a little bit of diversity and climate change. Um, also for supporting socioeconomic activities, tourism. Uh, however, the Mediterranean Sea, as we all know, has an uneven warming trend that uh, is very variable across regions and that affects several of the ecosystems within, within the Mediterranean Sea. In particular, the coralligenous communities that provide high habitat complexity, and mostly from the sediment of encrusting coralline algae and gorgonians. Uh, however, the coralligenous communities are being affected uh, by these uh, marine heat waves that happen in the Mediterranean. And as you can see in this graph, they have been increasing uh, in frequency and intensity in the in the recent years, uh, causing a or leading to mass mortality events. These mass mortality events are driving coralligenous communities towards collapse, producing uh, long-term consequences due to the characteristics of the species that inhabit the coralligenous. Um, one of the, the, the most important species or, or one of the species that have been used as focus are the Gorgonians, as we have seen in many of the, of the presentations in the symposium. Um, Gorgonians provide a structural complexity in the habitat. And one, for example, Paramuricia clavata is one of the most well-studied species within under this context of climate change in the Mediterranean. Uh, but um, it is characterized by its slow population dynamics, the restricted dispersal abilities, they have high mortality rates, it's low recruitment, it's a very long-lived animal. But despite that we all that we know all this, um, there are still gaps uh, in the understanding on on why these species react in so many variable ways to marine heat waves, um, and therefore um, 
based basically from these characteristics that this species has, it questions its evolutionary trajectory under, under this context of climate change. And this is why the main objectives of my of this chapter were to analyze the differential response to thermal stress between individuals, individuals and population of Maramuricia clavata across three consecutive years to refine the estimation of the response variability at very local scales because the variability also is very different depending on the geographical scale. And finally, to, ex to explore the potential underlying genetic um, and environmental factors that hinder this variability that is presented in this species. Uh, so how do we do this? We selected 30 adult colonies of more than 50 centimeters of length uh, from three different localities in the Medes Islands, which is located in the Catalonian coast of Spain. These colonies were specifically tagged with a little piece of, of plastic and we gave them a number and they were tagged at the very beginning of this study. Um, and we, in addition, we collected fragments of 10 centimeters from these colonies that were tagged uh, in the months of September after the, the summer. These fragments were, were up. Oh, this is doing something weird. Sure. Presentation. Okay. Right. This one. This one. Yeah. That's not in camera. Yeah. No. Still connected. Yeah, connected. Yeah. Maybe if we start it again, it might work. Then we'll Okay, a little bit of patience. Okay. It's okay? Yeah. Okay. So what do we do? Wait. Apparently you can do it. But they cannot see anything. Ah, okay. You can. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I can continue, but they won't understand anything. We know that computers uh, solve uh, half the problem they create, so, you know. No. Non riescono a vedere la pagina, sono online, non si vede. 
Okay. Okay. Uh, so I can look at the other one. I need to look at the other one. I Esas de poder es explicar tu trabajo sin las imágenes. Eh, pues si yo misma lo veo, sí. Mm -hmm. Bueno. ¿Quieres intentar? Sí. Porque, Porque igual. La red ya... Vale. Yo igual la puedo ver, entonces en teoría sí que podría seguir, pero explicando. If everybody agree, we try to present the paper without images because uh, there is no possibility to, to show you images. So thanks, uh, <laughs> Sandra, for trying. Uh -huh. <laughs> eh, ok. <clears throat> Where was I? So, um, yes, we um, selected 30 adult colonies um, in the Medes Islands. Um, these colonies were tagged to be able to follow them across the years, because remember, this is a temporal study. We um, collected fragments of approximately 10 centimeters of length in the months of September. And these fragments um, were allocated in a common garden experiment setup. They were taken to the aquarium experimental zone at the ICM in Barcelona. They were acclimated upon arrival and they were then put into the experiment that, that Yes, that consisted, that consisted of a control of at 18 degrees and a, a, and a, and a, and a treatment of stress with high temperatures at 25 degrees. So each of the fragments was allocated in each condition. Uh, we further then measured the percentage of tissue necrosis um, for 25 days as a proxy of colony response to thermal stress in order to calculate its average and its survival. Um, so what we found was um, that the average tissue necrosis was very different across years, not very different across populations. So in here you are seeing three graphs representing the uh, tissue necrosis tendency. In the y-axis you find the mean extent of injury and in the x-axis you find the time in days of the experiment. And, and, and in essence we found that in 2015 and 16 the colonies were affected on average to up to a 40% of tissue necrosis by the end of the experiment. And this happens for all of the populations. Uh, whereas for 2017, the colonies, the colonies were completely affected with 100% of tissue necrosis by day 18 in most of the populations, except in one of them that reached 100% of tissue necrosis by day 24. In addition, we, um, we calculated the survival probability of colonies to remain healthy across the experiment. So here you are seeing the survival curves that represent the probability of colonies to remain healthy across the, the, the time. Um, and we found that in 2015 and 16, the probability of surviving for these colonies that were tagged is likely decreased uh, after day 18 in all of the populations. Whereas for 2017, the probability of remaining healthy for these colonies sharply decreased er very early in the experiment around day 10. And this happened for all of the populations as well. So finally, in order to characterize better the temporal variability of these colonies, we created a heat map representing the the, the tendency or, or the levels of necrosis during the experiment. So in here you are seeing um, each of these columns corresponds to one of the individuals. The colors corresponds to the level of necrosis from zero to 100. Um, and each of the squares corresponds to the level that was given during the, the day number one to day 25. And the horizontal uh, 
fragments corresponds to the to what was happening every year of the study. So what we found was that at least a 40% of the total individuals in each of the populations uh, that are highlighted in black arrows um, show from zero to 30% of tissue necrosis in at least one of the tested years. And this happened more often in the very first week of the experiment, whereas there were other individuals that show um, uh, high levels of necrosis of around 50% of necrosis in the very first week of the experiment. So what basically this is saying that there were individuals or there are individuals of Paramoresia clavata that tend to uh, get affected later uh, to the exposure uh, to the exposure to temperature, whereas there are others that get affected really early in the in to this uh, temperature. And in addition, in 2017, we also noted that um, individuals tend to get affected earlier in the experiment. So as a conclusion, we show a very strong temporal variability in the response to thermal stress for all the three populations of Paramoresia clavata. The mortality is reached faster at the year 2017 with 100% of tissue necrosis by day 18, with a less pro with a decrease in the survivor probability in around day 10, and um, with individuals getting affected earlier during the same year. We believe that this is happening uh, due to the impact of recent thermal thermal conditions, more specifically for due to the summer before the experiment. We notice, uh, according to uh, these graphs uh, obtained from the TimbetNet initiative, um, that during the summer of 2017, the temperatures were really high, but they were really prolonged. So they lasted June, July, August, etc. In comparison with the other years, in 2015 we also find high temperatures, but they didn't last as long as in as in 2017. And this is why we believe that this variability is very strongly correlated with the impact of the recent thermal conditions. So as for their steps, we would like to characterize uh, throughout the thermal regimes during the years of the experiment to identify the genotypes that might be prone to resist or to be sensible to these high temperatures because these high temperatures will continue happening in the Mediterranean Sea, as we all know. And finally, to characterize the gene expression patterns underlying the response to thermal stress because these might shed lights into what biological functions might be used by these organisms in order to respond to to climate change. Um, so I would like to thank to my supervisors, Joachim and John Baptiste. I would like to thank to the MedRecover Research Group where I am working right now and to all the organizations that make possible uh, this investigation and for the organizers of the symposium that allow me to be here. So if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. And if I don't know, we can discuss later when I know. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sandra, and excuse for these technical troubles. But I'm confident that the audience uh, got your message uh, and uh, the interesting information uh, contained in your speech. So, any question? No question at all? I've been sad to see that the magnificent Gorgonian I saw in the Medes. 35 years ago and uh, so badly. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, thank you again. And uh, we can go to the next uh, thank you. communication by Eva Turicchia. Who will uh, teach us something about bio erosion in uh, North Adriatic coral region of reefs. <laughs> Yeah, so that's me. It's okay. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you to be here. Uh, as uh, Professor uh, Nike Bianche said, I'm talking about uh, bio erosion processes uh, in the North Adriatic or regional reefs. Uh, the um, North Adriatic uh, Coralligional Shelves host uh, several hundreds 
hundred of coralligenous uh, reef scatter on uh, uh, sedimentary bottom, as uh, you can see in the map. They range uh, as a size from a few hundred to several thousand square meters. They um, range also from uh, half a meter to four, four meter height, and um, the uh, particularity is uh, they are characterized uh, by an uh, heterogeneous, heterogeneous benthic assemblages. Uh, they are an spot of um, the diversity. They are threatened by um, anthropogenic impacts and uh, global climate change related disturbance. But uh, what is, is uh, important, at least for my presentation right now, is that they are shaped by by construction and by erosion processes. In particular, by boring organism can create shelter for a different organism, but at the same time, they can um, weaker the structure of the coralliginous. And in the longer run, hoping, if the by erosion processes are higher than by construction processes, the coralliginous can, I don't know, not disappear, but for sure suffer. And uh, in the um, North Adriatic Sea, we have uh, builder organism like the encrusted calcareous rhodophyte uh, from the genome Lithophilo, Lithotamnio, or uh, Pessonelia. But about the boring organism, we have uh, mailing uh, the sponges from the genus Cleona, in particular Cleona viridis that you can see in the picture over here. <laughs> it's uh, widespread uh, and really abundant in all of the uh, rocky outcrop uh, in the North Adriatic Sea. But we have also Clona rodensi, Clona tosina, and Pione vastifica. So, what we did in um, previous studies, we identified three main uh, epibentic assemblages. Uh, across uh, this uh, biogenic reef. One characterized by encrusting calcareous rhodophyte, another one characterized by turf and encrusting sponges, and another one characterized by uh, ascidians and uh, sponges. In one of each of these kind of assemblages, we uh, did an um, experiment, and in particular, we deploy travertite tiles in one of each of these study sites. Moreover, we did a photographic sampling in 10 different study sites according to these different kind of assemblages, but randomly. And the photographic sampling has been done using a knowing area of 20, 21 for, for 28 centimeter. So here you can see the tile experiment. In August 2005, we deployed this uh, travertine tile, but after 12 here, you can see they were part of uh, the coralliginous habitat. <laughs> Actually, it was uh, quite difficult to retrieve them. And uh, so uh, a part of uh, these uh, tiles that we deployed, we use for other experiment, but a part we use to quantify by erosion and by construction processes. Uh, by erosion uh, or boring organism uh, in particular can leave a trace not just uh, on the surface of uh, our reef, but most of all inside. And uh, we can have a different organism like um, mollusks, like a bivalve that, uh, for example, in the red box can leave an eight shape on the surface, but inside it's uh, like a drop. Uh, or uh, we can have um, polycates, serapyl polycate, and of course uh, we have our boring sponges from the genioclona, which uh, on the substrate appears like uh, a green mass with the papule, that is called the different part of the sponge that communicate with the outside, but inside the substrate it creates uh, 
uh, chambers uh, and the branches that are all interconnected. So, uh, how we can study this kind of uh, bio erosion? One way that we can find we found uh, was uh, using X ray computer tomography. What does it mean? So, that um, using like X ray, we reconstruct our tiles in three dimension uh, without um, um, ruin our sample, destroy our sample. And we were able to reconstruct, yes, externally, but uh, we also been able to see inside, uh, like uh, an X-ray, a common X-ray. And uh, what we saw is, uh, for example, we, um, we have the tile, on, uh, on top of the slide and uh, the corresponding uh, 3D uh, the tomography, a slice uh, in the middle, uh, more or less. The yellow pattern is due by clonal rodensis, while the um, green pattern has been done by uh, clonal viridis. So it's the same tile, but we can imagine what how eroded was the tile inside without doing this kind of tomography. So uh, thanks to, we uh, published an article where we quantify the uh, by erosion and also the by construction. Over here, I'll just show you the result by, by erosion. And you can see that after 12 years, in the sun site, the by erosion was almost 50% that the correspond around 13 kilogram, kilogram per square meter. So it's a, a huge amount of uh, bio erosion. So <laughs> thanks with the knowledge that we know, we gain, uh, we want to do a step forward because um, having in mind that uh, this coralliginous reef are shaped by this, uh, the balance of this true kind of process, we want to try to find a method to investigate and monitoring the bioerosion, but uh, yeah, without taking pieces of, of uh, the coralliginous. So um, we, uh, thanks to um, the knowledge uh, that we had, we apply an indirect method. In particular, we um, uh, estimate we uh, assess the percent covered of uh, the uh, clonaviridis on the tiles associated with the um, by erosion uh, assessed by the CT and uh, we obtain a relation so, so the percent covered of clona uh, in the experimental tiles vary from one to more than 70 percent and the corresponding biomass range for uh, from four kilograms square meter to more than 15. using this uh, regression uh, um, model we uh, um, use the uh, photographic sample that we did on the natural substrate. We estimate the person cover of Cleona and uh, using the relation, we estimate the uh, eroded mass of Cleona in the natural substrate with the related error. So, um, yes, we <laughs> find that there is a uh, quite uh, high variability, of course. And uh, for example, in one site, we have um, an estimation of a erosion from six kilograms square meter with a prediction limit from zero to 12, while in another, uh, almost eight kilograms per square meter with a prediction limit from two to 13. So it's quite high, but at least we can measure this, uh, this kind of error. And uh, we interpolate this uh, data uh, across uh, the sampling size. And uh, what we can see here is the potential uh, by erosion by Cleona in uh, the study area. Obviously, it's not all uh, by eroded, just the spot that, that you saw in the first slide. But uh, what, what we can see is uh, 
there is uh, a pattern from north to south where uh, the uh, northern part is the most bio eroded while uh, on the corner is the, the less one. This is uh, probably because uh, the northern part is the most bio eroded because there are more uh, um, encroaching calcareous rhodophyte. So they can provide a suitable habitat uh, for the bio sponges for eating it and uh, growing. Uh, so the next step is uh, to give a more accurate uh, uh, data and uh, use the small natural substrate that uh, we collect to estimate the bioerosion directly on uh, the natural substrate and uh, provide uh, a complementary monitoring tool for uh, uh, photographic sampling monitoring uh, in uh, the area or uh, in the Mediterranean. Uh, thank you for your attention and uh, if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, Eva, for this very interesting and novel presentation. And there is time for a short question with a quick answer. Please. No questions. I want them. OK. I go. <laughs> Thank you again, Eva. OK, last speech. Annalisa Azzola will uh, talk about the variability between observer in uh, the rapid visual assessment. Eccolo. Good afternoon to everyone. Uh, today I'm going to show you a study about the observer effect in visual methods used for uh, um, characterization of coralligenous assemblages. Among the several uh, surveying ecological surveying methods, uh, the use of non-destructive techniques is, uh, of course, to be preferred and highly recommended, especially for the study and the monitoring of uh, valuable habitats such as uh, coralligenous reefs. This kind of non-destructive techniques, in fact, uh, allow the collection of data without uh, collecting and uh, uh, sacrifice the specimens. Uh, among the several uh, visual methods, uh, the rapid visual assess assessment methods respond well to this need because uh, it is based on observation and measurement uh, made directly underwater. Furthermore, this method allows for uh, uh, detailed uh, taxonomic uh, data and uh, a comprehensive data because it, is, it uh, includes uh, ecological and topographical information. <laughs> Uh, even if uh, the visual survey are the most appropriate techniques, uh, as uh, I told, uh, for the study of coral legionous assemblages, uh, they may have uh, a limit due to the observer effect. In fact, information collected by different diving scientists, uh, for sure, uh, may be biased by their uh, dissimilar expertise and experience, uh, such as uh, scientific career, specialization, and uh, uh, the number of scientific dives done uh, during their lives. So uh, this possibly uh, influence uh, sampling quality and data analysis. So uh, the aim of uh, the present work is to evaluate uh, the observer effect uh, in the characterization and evaluation of uh, the coralligenous assemblages, in particular in uh, Portofino Marine Protected Area. Underwater uh, surveys uh, were carried out by uh, two diving scientists uh, with different uh, expertise and level of experience. Actually, they were me and the professor Carlo Nike Bianchi. So you can understand uh, how huge was the difference between uh, our expertise and uh, expertise level. 
uh, experience sorry, level. Uh, we carried out underwater surveys in five sites of the marine protected area. And uh, in uh, each site, uh, we did a vertical transect every five collecting data every five meters depth from 50 meters to 25 meters, also recording uh, substratum slope. Uh, along uh, each vertical transect, uh, the percentage cover of conspicuous species was visually estimated and uh, recorded on our diving slates. Then um, all our data, uh, so the percentage cover of uh, the conspicuous species uh, was uh, organized in a data matrix to perform statistical analysis. Um, different assemblages were firstly recognized by cluster analysis and then named according to the SPARAC habitat classification. And finally, um, uh, an MDS analysis was performed to understand which environmental factor mostly uh, influence uh, the distribution of different assemblages. Then to highlight uh, the observer effect, uh, we uh, compare variability between uh, observers uh, with environmental variability. Uh, in particular, variability between observer were expressed by uh, dissimilarity between the two diving scientists, dissimilarity percentage, and uh, we use the bright cartis index. Um, while uh, the natural environmental variability was measured uh, subtract subtracting variability between observer from variability within each assemblage. Uh, through the cluster analysis, the three assemblages were identified. The first one uh, was dominated by the brown algae Zanardinia typus, Dictyota dichotoma, and Dictyopteri polypoides. The second one uh, was dominated by the brown algae Cistosera zosteroides. And the last one was dominated by the Sifan paramuricia clavata. Actually, these uh, three assemblages match with the SPARAC habitats, as I'm showing you in the slide. And here you can see the uh, SPARAC interpretation manual of uh, marine habitats type we used to identify uh, these three assemblages. Uh, uh, the statistical analysis showed that uh, the distribution of the three assemblages uh, um, was mainly influenced by depth and only secondarily by the substratum slope. The first uh, assemblage was uh, uh, distribu distributed between 25 and 40 meters, especially at around 30 meters depth. The second one uh, with the Cistodera zosteroides occurred between 30 and 40 meters depth, peaking at 45. And the last one was uh, widely distributed all along the depth we um, investigated, but peaks, peaked at uh, 40 meters depth. Uh, furthermore, we observed that the first assemblage uh, was uh, in the depth zone most affected by the colonization of the invasive algae Caulerpa cilindracea and the development of mucilaginous aggregates. Uh, concerning the uh, observer effect, uh, uh, within each assemblage, uh, we observed that the uh, dissimilarity between the two observers was always significantly lower than environmental variability. As you can see in this graph, uh, observer's effect is uh, represented by the uh, blue box plot. The environmental variability could uh, be explained by the species patchiness. The first assemblage, for the first assemblage, assemblage, in fact, none of the species was present in all the observation we done in the different sites. And uh, for the second and the third assemblages, only the dominant species, so Cistoseira zosteroides and Paramuricea clavata, uh, were recorded in all the relevant observation we done in the different sites. 
So to conclude, um, our results show that the difference between observer did not uh, impair the characterization and evaluation of uh, coral legionose uh, assemblage in the marine protected area of Portofino. And uh, we can also say that field observation and uh, uh, rapid visual assessment uh, method we use resulted objective and reliable uh, with the advantage of obtaining data immediately without the need to uh, do further time-consuming analysis such as the photos or video analysis. Um, so finally, uh, we can say that visual method may be considered robust to observer effect, but it's also important to say that the, the assessment of uh, observer, observer variability should always be considered in visual method and in survey protocols for the characterization and evaluation of valuable habitats such as coralliginous reef. Thank you. Many thanks, Annalisa, for being so in time. Even if you didn't specify who was the expert, who was the trainee, but I, perhaps the people understood it. You so, don't need. They don't need. There is time for discussion if you have a question. No question. You have been too clear. Thank you. So thank you again, Annalisa. And uh, we have to, st okay, we have. We are late as usual in every Congress. Uh, in addition, we had also computer problems, so we are partly justified. And uh, we can open the general discussion. Our section is a, a prosecution of the former one, so probably uh, we can continue uh, the previous one. And uh, maybe this session was characterized by I would say methodological aspect that might be of interest because all these mythos are rather novel. So perhaps there is something to, to say about problems or improvement. But before starting the discussion, uh, let me say that I'm very proud to have chaired this session. I have, uh, I had five presentations, all made by women. In a recent uh, paper on PLOS, uh, it has been said that women are discriminated in scientific publication. And uh, I can say proudly that is not the case uh, here today. So, <laughs> <laughs> an applause for our scientists, our women scientists. So if there is anybody willing to start the discussion, perhaps there is still something pending from the previous section. Okay, wonderful. Uh, hello, my name is Vasilis Grovasiliou. I come from Greece. I work for the Ionian University and the Hellenic Center for Marine Research. I would like to mention something about citizen science and coralliginous. Uh, you saw it in the presentation of, uh, we saw in the presentation of Julia Gatti before about the CGES met for diverse protocol. And as she said, it was developed um, in, uh, to, to be applied for three different countries for France, Turkey, and Greece. And one of the difficult points that we, we had, and we have to explain this, first of all, was the engagement of divers. Uh, it was very, very difficult to find an organization like uh, like Polaris, you were very, very uh, lucky to have such an organization in, in Marseille uh, in order to be able to engage divers. And uh, unfortunately, it was very, very difficult to do that in Greece and in Turkey. And I, I think that it's also difficult in other Eastern Mediterranean countries. Uh, one of the possible reasons is that uh, in our case, coralliginous sites are much deeper. And they have also a very different structure. For example, I saw in the presentation of Laura about the Paramuritsia clavata walls. And in our case, to find a wall with Paramuritsia clavata, you have to go to 40 to 50 meters uh, deep. And it's only in very specific parts of the country. So it's very difficult to find divers and to find motivated divers and organizations like, uh, like Polaris that is going to, to help with this. Uh, so 
in the end, it was very difficult for us. And our communities were also different because they are more sponsor dominated. So that's another thing that when you we try to develop protocols which are uh, pan-Mediterranean, in fact, they are more biased towards the Western Mediterranean Sea. And in the end, it does not work so well. I just wanted to highlight this because it was a problem that we had. And it was a very good example that in Greece and in Turkey, unfortunately, did not work out that well as with the Northwestern Mediterranean Sea. And so that was my comment. Thank you. Uh, in addition, I think that the problem touched by Vasilis is quite general. So everybody agree? <laughs> okay, uh, just to try to vivify the audience, let me be provocative uh, twice. Uh, my first provocation is uh, when we say we are studying monitoring uh, coral regions to protect it, to evaluate, evaluate its state of health. What do we mean exactly? Because we saw very clearly in this session that coral region may, may, may comprehend two different things, the, the bioconstruction, the basal uh, deposit of uh, uh, calcareous matter by the coralline algae, uh, remember the, the splendid presentation by Eva, or might be the scenic uh, seascape of the Gorgonian forest, as shown by, in particular, Sandra, if I remember well. So what, what exactly what we want to conserve, protect, evaluate? The basal concretion on the upper layer, they are not uh, always correlated. In my old, of course, I, I'm old. In my old studies, I saw that perhaps if you have a very good upper layer with dense Gorgonian population, you, you don't have enough light reaching the, the, the substrate for the growth coral and algae. In other cases, we have splendid coralligenous formation without Gorgonian. So uh, when we compare the two things, so we have to find some methods to express this difference. And my second provocation that I address especially to ATEF is that uh, I saw that there are many initiatives, uh, independent, I would say, about the citizen science, especially if I understood well in Italy, French, Spain. So perhaps uh, it's time to, to think about uh, a common review of meters problem approach, and maybe Rakpa can promote that. I don't know. Uh, it, it's interesting to see what the citizen science could give us about the correligionals monitoring or, or assessing. So I try to provocate. It's up to you now. Okay, uh, I understand we are tired. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Oh, Ponti, you're welcome. Uh, thank you, Vasilis, and, and also Nike. I, I want to be even more provocative. <laughs> uh, the, 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 the issue is uh, uh, how is our defini definition for uh, good health of uh, our color regions, uh, reefs of uh, our habitat, how, how we want to define it. For sure, we can uh, distinguish uh, uh, layered habitat, uh, the, 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 the growing of uh, the substratum uh, is uh, for sure a good, a good uh, indicator of, of the health. The, the presence of different kinds of species can, can be considered too. Of, of course, uh, th there is place where you have uh, Gorgonian and the other place where you have, haven't Gorgonian, but that doesn't mean necessarily. So uh, the, the, the issue of the biotic indicator itself uh, is tricky because uh, um, if you have, uh, uh, for instance, uh, sensitive species, I, I mean species that do not tolerate uh, some kind of impact, uh, they are difficult trees in place where there, there is such kind of impact, of course. 
but uh, uh, that doesn't mean that uh, tolerant speeches, uh, when they are present, are, are testifying bad bad situation. It's not not necessarily. So coming back to the, to the uh, question posed by Kim, the, the the need to to standardize our uh, sampling effort. Uh, so my concern is. Uh, the, the, the time that we have underwater, especially if we work by scuba diver, uh, is extremely lim limited. So for sure, we have to optimize every action. And, and uh, if you are going for, for a specific task, for, for, for instance, an experiment, probably a, a manipulative experiment, I mean, probably you have no time to do a, a, a any other things that, that uh, your works. Uh, of course, we, we can try to ask to every people to the Mediterranean Sea to at least collect some pictures. But there is another issue beyond. Okay, today we are, we are asking that, but how to compare with the data collected before? And uh, uh, we, we never know uh, the, 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 what the future uh, provide us in terms of new technologies for, for uh, uh, monitoring. And so it, the, the question posed is extremely important. Uh, we have to, to reason in terms of uh, retro compatibility of the measure we are taking now. For, for instance, uh, Eva showed a tentative method to uh, use pictures to estimate uh, uh, by erosion. That, that can be a way to, to solve such kind of problem, of course. I have not the solution in, in my pocket, of course. It's just a prov provocation. Nobody has solution. We have to uh, seek for them uh, together, I think. Any other comment, provocation? Another Italian. You see Italians are, are, are solid, at least. <laughs> I think that the problem is that coral agents, as you were saying before, it's so complicated to standardize. So why for Posidonia Oceanica Meadows, we can have uh, easily um, standard conditions, reference condition, and we can compare, we can do the ratio between actual values and reference values. For coral agents systems, it's too much complicated, but there are some, uh, visual techniques, as uh, Professor Gerard Basileo knows, uh, for example, PhotoQuad, which can help us to monitor, to assess uh, at least quite qualitatively the coralligenous status. Uh, I think that one of the problem of our evaluation is that we confuse the beautiful with the useful. I mean, Gorgonians are the most attractive things of coralligenous, so we got aware about the status of Gorgonians, but they are not the only organisms that lives that live in coral legions systems. We have bioconstructors, which are diverse from Gorgonians. So I think that uh, it should be useful to create a database, a baseline of species, and maybe to try to give an ecological values at each species as we do for shallower ecosystems such as uh, semi-submerged marine caves or something like that. The fact is coral legion systems are complicated due to the time underwater as um, we, we were seeing before. So um, I think that there's no solution, but we can try by visual assessment and by maybe standardize it and to find some reference condition to compare our results in the Mediterranean basin. Thank you. Kim and, uh, oh, how many? Finally, and not all Italian, you see? In line of being provocative, I would say that we have the solution. We have the solution because we have been working. We are here, I don't know, more than 100 people, 70 people. And if we collaborate together and if we put a plan, a common plan, we can solve many things. The problem is that now we are here 
everyone sharing and really happy to be here and to share our experiences. But then when we come back home, we will keep doing what we are doing instead of, ah, yeah, but we have the solution. Let's work together. Thank you. Um, hello, I had just a comment. Um, we're talking about benthic species a lot in the coral legions, and it seems to me we've completely forgotten other species that are a part of the coral legion is it it gives um, uh, of course we're working more and more on photos maybe that this is a reason but uh, that means that we're going further away to the uh, ecosystem approach and uh, we had the same problem a little bit this uh, yesterday with the posidonia so um what can we do about this? Is it just uh, the big erect species that we should look at? Or should we completely forget the fish, the, the holothurians or whatever that goes with it? Um, just a question. Uh, I am agree with some of previous comments that uh, we are not very much agree of the definition what is coraligenous. So I think there is no possibility to have the common method for all, all of them. And I think it's um, more important not to have the same method. It doesn't mean that we will not work together. But I think uh, there is no sense to compare things that are different. For example, my savalia with your, uh, I don't know, coraliginous algae is completely different and method should be different. So I think it's important that we all have information about different methodologies different possibilities and then we follow in our own place we are following our own coraligenous and we are taking care what is the problem for that particular uh, coraligenous and how to solve that and then we can give uh, one number for politician is it number one or medium or low or good and like that we can uh, compare it Mm, I will just like to add one last thing and very small one. We have mentioned uh, a lot about methods, about divers, about uh, working together. But I think I, I noticed uh, a lack of something. I think we are we, we also need to bring to the big picture, to the biology of these organisms. Uh, what are their limits in, in its evolution? What are the populations going towards? And I think this information might be important to include in this discussion. Because yes, we have a lot of methods. The Mediterranean is really big. We have a lot of ecosystems where they have Gorgonians or not. But it's also important to, to, to bring up this information in order to follow on a specific track to conserve or preserve these ecosystems. So that's just my last comment. Okay, continuing with the provocations and, and so on. Uh, well, on one hand, I don't think that we can call coralliginous something that don't have coralline algae as a substrate. And I think that we can start from that. Then later are the other species that are living on or around the species. It's like with the uh, coral reef. You have to take into account also the other species that are living in that coral reef, but we know what we mean by saying a, a, a coral reef. Uh, with the uh, coralliginous and the differences, I think that this is happening with most of the habitats. There are many, a few of them that are quite similar in the whole Mediterranean, 
but still there are differences with the with the Posidonia and, and, and with others. But with the coralligenous, we have to take into account that it's coming from very shallow waters to very deep waters in many different areas with different characteristics. And then the coralligenous that we are going to find is, is, is quite different. I understand, as I was saying before, I think that we have to work in the way that we are working more together, if it is possible, and trying to put these kind of numbers that at the end are, are useful. But for me, the provocative part is to say that when we are talking about habitats, we have to think about the role that they play instead of about numbers. And I think that in that case, uh, we have to evaluate and to assess if the coral genus is playing the role that they have to play. Okay, I agree with uh, what you said, of course. And I, pro I think that the problem with the coralligenous, uh, more than uh, with other other habitat, is semantic. Uh, you all, all you know that the, the words come from the French coralligen, and Marion used it to indicate uh, an habitat who was generating the red coral. Now we know that is no more the case because the red coral has little to do with the coralligenous, or, or at least not only with the coralligenous. So now we are thinking about coralligenous could be something like generated by coralline algae. But uh, I mean, probably we have to invest uh, a little more um, intelligence, I would say, to a typification of the coralligenous, of different coralligenous kinds, because uh, I always think that the environmental dynamics needs two steps. First, characterization then evaluation, because to evaluate something that you, which is not well characterized, I think uh, make uh, noise, make a confusion. So probably we have to work a little bit. I, I think that the RAXPA is doing a good work with the different habitat description. So we are on the way now. We can distinguish different kinds of uh, coralligenous, uh, perhaps uh, when we have uh, a clear idea or what we are working on, we can arrive to standardize methods, uh, indices, uh, and so on. But we have to focus on that, I think, because every time comes here correctly saying, I study coralligenous, then you discover that they are studying different things. And uh, we have to work on that. Um, so if there are no other questions, okay, before closing the discussion, I was to thank again the speaker. To thank again the audience, of course, but especially, let me say, I, I would like to thank the translator because they stay, sit there, speaking, speaking, speaking for hours, and uh, we provide uh, of their work, uh, which is uh, harder than probably we think. So thank you to everybody. Okay, thank you, Carlo, for uh, sharing this session. And uh, we break here. Uh, we will meet again at eight o'clock uh, for a gala dinner, so uh, we can continue discussing our future collaboration, Kim, around uh, uh, tasty dishes and uh, drinks. Thank you. So we meet at eight o'clock. Uh, you ha you have the um, the. Um, the address um, in the entrance, okay? Thank you.